on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. in the Spotlight, featuring people from all walks of Dominican life, spotlighting their triumphs and tragedies, dreams, hopes, aspirations, untold stories, touching the human and personal side of all people in politics, religion, sports, business, music, culture, the media, and more. Get it to know our farmers, our public servants, youth, and the ordinary Dominican. Listen to their stories. No limitations, no restrictions, no holds barred. In the spotlight, we also spotlight interesting topics, issues, and relevant situations. Don't miss In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. In the Spotlight. FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. in the Spotlight, featuring people from all walks of Dominican life, spotlighting their triumphs and tragedies, dreams, hopes, and aspirations, untold stories, touching the human and personal side of all people in politics, religion, sports, business, music, culture, the media, and more. Getting to know our farmers public servants, youth, the ordinary Dominican. Listen to their stories. No limitations, no restrictions, no holds barred. In the spotlight, we'll also spotlight interesting topics, issues, and relevant situations. Don't miss In the Spotlight on Q95 FM Radio every Monday night from 8 p.m. I know some of you all love the music. You love the theme music of the program. And I know sometimes too that you say, for that it's time to start. <laughs> Let me start off first by thanking God for allowing me to be able to be here every Monday night with the exception of the, the carnival holiday. From the start of the year, I've been here. Thank God for that. Thank God for you, the listeners of the program. Those of you who listen via radio and those of you who join us via social media. Thank God for you. Thank God for Q95 for allowing me this platform to have this program. And thank God for everyone else who supports in one way or the other. Thank God for the guests who come through, who consent to be on the program. Without them, we would not have a program. <coughs> Happy International Women's Day. The day is almost over. But since our program is now beginning, we now say happy International Women's Day to all the beautiful women 
amazing, strong, accomplished women all over the world. And even if you're not all of that, and you're going through some difficult times right now, you know, be strong. Happy International Women's Day to you as well. We're choosing to challenge this year. And we will talk a bit about that as well with our guest on the program tonight. Our acknowledgements, Q95 FM Radio, thank you. Josephine Gabriel and the Company Limited providing a lovely Fritz Cato bottle of wine for my guest tonight. I hope she'll have a drink when she gets home. Thank you, Josephine Gabriel and Company, and also our water, Twapital Water. We thank you for that. We thank Deepex. We thank Jordan Jerome. Jordan Jerome is the producer and host of What's This? Follow his page on Facebook and other social media platforms. Thank you, Jordan, for your support. And my dynamic graphic designer who does really good clean work, Akim Lowe. Thank you, Akim. Our social media platforms include the In The Spotlight radio show page, and we have the group by the In The Spotlight radio show. You can go on any of these and find the program tonight. Remember to follow us as well, like us. We appreciate that. My Fadina Fountain's page is at its max, but you can follow me. And I also have my public page, which is Fadina Fernanda Frampton. Follow and like it as well. We're on also on Instagram. Our handles, I think mine is just Fadina Frampton, and I think the show is in the spotlight. We also have our Triple F Marketing and Advertising page. <coughs> so we invite you to follow and like that page as well. We're still building it. So not doing so much on it as yet, but we're still building it. And for those of you who would like to give support, some kind of support to the In The Spotlight radio show, you have recommended that I um, suggest for those who are willing and able and this, this is important. Once you have the ability to support us, we would definitely welcome it. You're not obligated, but once you have the ability to support us, we would definitely appreciate it. For more banking, our user ID is 767-235-7565. That's 767-235-7565. The account number is 1000-6952. That's 1000-1 one and three zeros, a six, a nine, a five, a nine, and a two. We also have PayPal, which is Fernanda Frampton, Fernanda, not Fernanda, but Fernanda Frampton at gmail.com. As I said, you know, this is just for those of you who have offered to support in somewhere there and what it is that you would be supporting you know there's some things that happens behind the scenes for the program thank god you know for q95 for working with me for the program uh, but you know we have some t-shirts that somebody has donated i was told that i may not get it duty free because of the fact that it's brand new t-shirts i don't know so if you could help us with that that would be awesome we also, you know, would like to boost our, our stuff on social media. There's different things that we would love to do. Our graphics, we do weekly graphics. There's different things that we would like to do. And if you can support us, that would be greatly appreciated. 8.19 is the time in the studios of Q95. This is the In The Spotlight radio <coughs> show. And we're not going to waste any more time. We have to get going with the program. Good evening to the phenomenal Dr. Valda Henry. Dr. Henry, a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Thank you for that. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a great honor, I guess, until you've made it in the spotlight. You've not yet made it. And so I want to say good evening to all the listeners. I want to say happy International Women's Day to all women um, listening and to even if not listening. 
But I also want to direct before we go further to express my deepest condolences to the family of the young man who passed. I mean, it's only this afternoon I recognized that I knew, knew his family. I kept saying the face was familiar, but I couldn't place him. And it was only this afternoon when Wilder said to me, it was Charlotte's son, and I said, yeah, that's it. That's who he, who he looks like. So Charlotte George, Mimi George, and Indu George, and the entire family. His grandmother, Yuri Lopin Bells. My heartfelt condolences. I pray God strengthen you during this difficult time and his soul rests. And I extend the same to the family as well. Happy International Women's Day to you as well, you. Um, Dr. Valerie. I know this is a day that you acknowledge and you recognize and that you take very seriously. I'm going to allow you first, before we do anything else, to extend the same to um, all the women, those who have passed through your phenomenal women's symposium, those who are listening near and far, say something to them, especially as it put into the theme, choose to challenge. Well, that is the theme by the International Women they choose to challenge. But the UN women also had a theme. Women in leadership, achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world. So I would kind of marry the two that, you know, what it is calling us to do, it beckons us, as I said earlier in a, in a post I made, to take action, to not just lament about the things, but to take action because we know in COVID-19, great disruptions. And so a lot of the gains that we made may be eroded. Um, the, the, the research has shown that there's also an increase in violence due to the remote work because no more persons at home and they're in unsafe homes. And we know we have these two gruesome murders at the start of the year of women. And so it calls us to like a zero tolerance to violence and to take action. So it challenges us to stand. And Lisa Bastian had a post this morning about walking the walk walking the talk, I'm um, talking the talk and walking the walk, but it's also about walking the talk. And I think that's what it challenges us to do, to stand up for something, to stand up for injustice, to stand up for um, equality for women and equal opportunities um, for all persons so that we could all live in a peaceful and prosperous environment. So it's really beckoning us to take action and to stand for something. And, and I'm actually just looking for a post that you shared um, with us, a flyer that yes. you shared with, with us today um, for, for International Women's Day. And you say that women must lead the charge and take action against inequality in all its forms to create a future of equal opportunities for women in all spheres of life. Women, let us stand together, let us work together to achieve a world free of violence, shaming and blaming. Let us create a world where we can thrive in peace and prosperity to be our own best selves and fulfill our God-given purpose. Women onwards and upwards towards an equal future in a COVID-19 world. Within this, I see a lot of reference being made to equal and equality. Why is that in, important to you, Dr. Henry? I almost start, I feel like we're starting the serious it, end of it, but it we're is. not. But <laughs> in fact, I have an issue with the equal, but that is the equal opportunity. I for me to equal opportunity because I always say, and I know I get into some problems with some women who will try to, uh, you know, give me some flack. Yes. I said we are not equal, and the world is not an equal world. Even the Lord, when he was sharing our talents, he didn't give equal talents. But what we must have is equal opportunity. We must all have the same access to education, same access to health, same access to, to a, a peaceful environment. We must have the access to, same access to finance, to, to fulfill our dreams. And that's what we must work for. Because, you know, for that, some persons, and I'm sure you know that for your own experience, mm -hmm. great up, they have brilliant children, brilliant minds, and they have great plans. But sometimes because of where they're born, sometimes because of the environment in which they are, they don't get the opportunity to fulfill. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even we, they, they are stereotyped. And so just because they're from a certain particular point, part, say even in Dominica, we have that. So we don't give them an opportunity, a chance. And so sometimes if they don't have it within them, if they don't have a person who challenges them to overcome, what happened? Mm -hmm. They succumb. Yes. And they 
in fine, it's easier in fact, to, to go to the negative ways. And in fact, this afternoon I was facilitating a, a session for the Dominica Youth Business Trust and Social Entrepreneurship. It was a fantastic session with young entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to be. And you know, we had a little discussion in terms of that. Um, because one participant shared a very personal, um, his own experience, and then there was a nice discussion. And then out of that, you could see at least what resonated with me is that sometimes it's just the environment. Mm -hmm. It's just that caused certain actions. Mm -hmm. So instead of just blaming and shaming, I think it sometimes calls on us to know. And if we know, we can understand. And if you understand, you can then help appropriately. And not just help in the ways that we think the person needs help, but in the appropriate ways to assist that person. Is your passion only towards women? And, and, and I want to ask you another direct question in line with this. Are you a feminist? Well, I know that question was coming, you know. And the answer is I'm not. You're not. No. I, I, mean, I don't know what they mean by I was feminist. about to say to you, what is your understanding me, of a feminist? Well, it's women who just push the agenda of just women. Women. Okay. And I can never be that. Right. Why? I come from a home with a father mm -hmm. who played an instrumental part in my life. Mm -hmm. My mom died when I was six. Six? I come from a second father. His Excellency Louis Williams, who played a, a big father role in my life. I have brothers that I love dearly, my nephews, who are like my children. I have a son. I can't be, it can't be advancement of women at all costs. Yes. And one of the things I have found, you know, from my little, um, just, I wouldn't say the research, but my observation, is that a lot of feminists, or women who classify themselves as feminists in our Caribbean, a number of them, their boy children have done poorly. Mm -hmm. And I, for me, I was much younger then. I was saddened by that. I was not a mother yet or anything. I was still actually at university. And I was like, how could that be okay? That I've advanced so much and my child, mm -hmm. my boy child, mm -hmm has fallen yeah. on the wayside. Mm -hmm. No. I say to Nathan all the time, and I say that, and I mean that so deeply, that if he doesn't turn out right, if he doesn't fulfill God's purpose for his life, if all the accolades and all the accomplishments I have, for me, that would mean nothing. Mm -hmm. So I think, I, I, I think we men, and, and I, I, I stress for that, I think it's equal opportunities for all of us mm -hmm. so that no one really gets left behind. And so that's why we do the Final Caribbean Women, the Final Caribbean Men and our youth series, mm -hmm. which is like my big passion. And a family. And then we have the family symposium yes. because persons ask for it. And you know, one of the, um, the first set of persons where I was Inspector Weeks. And oh, oh gosh, Lucy, I forgot your real name. Oh God, Lucy, please forgive me. <laughs> and. and and you know, and we had such a robust um, discussion there. So no, I, I, it could for me, it has to be equal opportunities for all. But I understand the emphasis on women because in the past, for that, as I was saying to the group this afternoon, in the past, women could not vote, women could not open a bank account, women couldn't go to certain places, women couldn't choose certain careers, and of course, that could not have been right. And so you could see the push to ensure that women have equal opportunities to be all they want to be. But as the evidence continue to show, now if you go to universities, what, 70% of the graduates are women. women. Mm -hmm. And what we wanted was the opportunity. Yeah. And then we, we ran with it. But in running with it, sometimes what happened, some of the men stay behind. Because you see that. You see men dropping off their girlfriends or their wives. To university and they either sit in the car and they wait the whole time <laughs> or they go and have some drinks with their fellows no i encourage them to come along I agree. so the two of you and that is why sometimes you have breaks in marriages because the woman has advanced herself so much that then he has not moved much and then you know kind of a gap in terms of what we discuss in terms of our worldview because that's one of the great things about education 
it expands our worldview, it expands our horizon. And if one person's horizon is all around the world, and one person is just the, in problem. their corner of their homes, you can see how that can sometimes yes. lead to yes. difficulties. D Doc, you've, you've mentioned um, your mom passing at the age of six. You've mentioned Nathan. So we're going to talk a little bit about family yeah. and um, you know your, your entrance into the world and your, 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 your um, family tree. And, and and those areas that we want to know about. First of all, I want to ask about Nathan, right? Um, tell us about Nathan and how Nathan came to be. Nathan is the child of my dreams. I used to always dream I had a son, but I could never see a father. So I used to say that to my sisters, you know, there's a little last group of four of us. Explain that to us. What do you mean that you could never I could see, see I couldn't, I just knew I had a son I, you know, and my dreams. And mm -hmm. I tell you, I had these vivid dreams. Mm -hmm. like, even when things happen to me now, it's like I have been there, but I've never been. Mm -hmm. But it's because I dreamed it. And I would see this child. I was a mother of the son. But I could never see a father next to the son. I couldn't see a husband either. But I had a son. And my sisters used to laugh, Catherine in particular, my sister was just before me, Catherine. She's like, yeah, now tell me how this is going to happen. <laughs> I, I want to know too. <laughs> and, but it did. Because Nathan is my son without a father. Mm -hmm. But technically he has a father because mm -hmm. Nathan I adopted mm -hmm. when he was nine months old. Nine months? Yeah. How did that happen? Well, in the market, I told people it was May 19th, 2010. I had gone May 19th, we have specific dates. Yeah, 2010. I was actually in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I had gone to a conference. It was the last day of the conference. And I bumped at the conference. You know, I love shopping. I love shoes in particular and bags. And I was about to go to one of the stores. And I bumped into one of my cousins who I hadn't seen for years, Donna King. And so Donna and I connected, we were, you know, because it was her birthday that day and her husband had taken her out, but she had taken the afternoon off from work. And so Donna and I went, so she was taking me to the shops and other places. And we were in this wonderful department store, and I was in the shoe section and I was in shoe heaven. And I got this phone call from Ava McIntyre. Mm -hmm. yes, she continued to rest in peace. And she says, Ada, if you were going to have a child, what would you want? And I said, well, what kind of question is this? She said, well, I'll answer the question. What would you want, a girl or boy? I said, well, I guess it would be whatever the Lord wills. But I've always said I wanted to have a boy first because somewhere I read that having a boy first means your womb was blessed. And so I always said if I had to have any children, I wanted my first child to be a boy. She said, okay, great, that a boy it is. And I said, she said, yes, 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 I have a little boy. Um, who just came in this afternoon and we have to find a home for him. And I was racking my brain who I could call. But I came to collect something that, from Irving, that is Dr. Mark, or Minister of Health and Wellness now, who at the time lived opposite my sister, Connie, and His Excellency. And then she came to drop whatever from, from Dr. Mark. She said, oh, and she said, Connie, that's who? Vala, so Connie told her I wasn't there. She said, oh, it doesn't matter, give me a number. And she called me, she said, I know you're not here, but I'm telling you. And that was it. Instantly, I turned around and I started shopping. I For forgot shoes, I forgot um, you bags. Have, we, we were paused, dog, but you had not met the child. No, I hadn't. And I'm in the store, and I move now to the baby section. And I was like, well, wait, I have no idea. Is he, a, is he a big nine months? Is he a small nine months? Is he an average? And I started buying things from small to average to a big. Imagine on the way down, I met um, Mrs. Allen. Oh my and God, you're making me shiver. Look at my eyes. And they saw me walk and, and she said, Mrs. Allen said to me, Max's mom, she said, Mom, you oh, want to buy so many things for babies. They grow them so fast because, listen, it was something else. And then I called and I said, but wait, I don't even have a name for him. And at the hotel where I stayed, the Mayfair, they had this little book about their dog, the mascot. And I said, but I want to buy him that book so that... That was the place I stayed, and when he gets old enough, I'm going to take him back, take him to, to Boston, sorry, not Chicago, to Boston, and to stay at this hotel. And I said, but I don't have a name. And I called her back, and she said, I think it's Kenrick. You, you, 
His name was Kenry. Yeah, and so I said, she called back. She said, yes, I confirmed it's Kenry. So I got this book autographed for him as Kenry. And he asked, how then does his name become Nathan? Yes. So when I got home and I'm excited, I've come and I'm ready to go, she said he was at the hospital at the time. So I drove straight to the hospital, had my teddy bears, had my whole stuff. Oh. And then she says to me, no, Bobby, you can't just go because we have not finished the process. I said, which process? She said, because, you know, we have to go, you know, to the courts to do this. And then she says, well, I don't know. I said, let me tell you something, Ava. If this is a child that I'm going to have to give up at any one point, forget it. Mm -hmm. Find another person. Because once that child comes to me, that's it. There's no going back. And so I went to the hospital, and when she said they had not yet told the mom that, you know, he was going to get up there. So I have to not pretend. And at that time, a little Spanish boy had gotten mauled by a dog in Shawford, and he was at the hospital. So when I got there, I kind of, I met the parents, I was talking to them, and I said, can I see the little boy? You know, is it okay to visit him? And I had a little token I could give him. So I pretended, I was ready, I came Come to see the boy. But the truth is, I already came to have a look. At Nathan. At, at Nathan. At Kenrick. At, at Kenrick, yes. yes. And when I came, his mom was there breastfeeding him. And he looked so peaceful, that child. And he looked like a child who was here before, securing himself. And so I went talking to her, and you know, we talked, and I said to her. But I also noted there was nothing on that dressing table. There was no little toy, there was no powders, there was nothing. And so I talked and she said, well, yes, some relative promised to bring stuff for her, but nobody has brought it. And I said, do you mind? I could, I have some stuff in my can, and I was bringing a whole stuff in. I think that's after me. She said, well, they're ready now. <laughs> all those person have all of this things. I said, stop it. Bring less. <laughs> so I brought a little blue teddy bear, which she still has. I brought a little blue blanket, which she still has. I brought you know, creams and vaselines and, you know, this darker rash thing, I forget the, one, the name of it, and so forth. And I brought him a whole set of things. And then she was talking that they wanted to take a baby, but they couldn't take a baby and whatever, whatever. And I said nothing, I just listened. And then the next day I said, can I come back? I said to her, can I come back to visit him? And she said, yes, you can. And I said, is there anything you need? And so on. And so I went back to visit him, and maybe every day until. Um, he came out and then he was still in the hospital and then one day Ava calls me, like today, and I'm traveling tomorrow. And she calls me, she said, Why don't we have to go to court? She calls me about 10 o'clock and she said, we have to go to court at 11. I said, huh? She said, yes, so that we can do the arrangement and right. do this. Um, can we? I said, but if I'm traveling tomorrow, I have to know, double think. And then at the time, my sister Afini had a person working for her in the van. I said to the girl, she always wanted to come work for me. I said, I don't need a helper. I just need a person to come location. So I called and I said, will you come to take care of Nathan for me? And she said, yes. And then we went to court. But when we got to court, the magistrate wasn't there. And mm -hmm. so Eva said, you know what? But that child has to leave today. So they, the welfare department has the powers. So she, we went to the hospital, took Nathan, and they gave me Nathan. And then the nurse said, you know, he, he doesn't sleep for the night at all. He cries a lot. And he hmm. does not drink from a bottle. He doesn't use a bottle at all. So you have to get him a cup. And like a CP cup. So I said, fine, that's not the problem. I run into town with my mm -hmm. CP cups and my baby stuff, my cereal, my milk, my, my stuff. And I'm ready to rock and roll with me from what I'm traveling next day. And so my sister, Afinia, I got the girl to look after him, but I, I can't just leave a person I don't mm -hmm. really know mm -hmm. with my son. Mm -hmm. Because as my friend, cousin Pinky will tell you, that was my son from the time yeah. I told him. And she said, always said, don't tell her she didn't make him. Mm -hmm. And um, and after they came to stay at home with him. And um, that was it. That was it. Did you ever have to go to court? Yes, the following week we okay. went, okay. and they gave you at the time uh, like a limited guardianship. Okay. So then you go back in a month, and they assess whether it's a good fit, whether the child adapted to you and you adapted to the child, and also, and then after that, they, I can give you another year of this temporary thing, or they can give you, I forget what it's called now, but whatever it is that you can now adopt mm -hmm. child. So a month after, it was a perfect fit, and as I told, and I will always be forever. Um, you know, thankful for Magistrate Gloria Augustus mm -hmm. because she was the magistrate 
And after that month, I was given this guardian ad litem, I think it's called, where I could officially adopt him. And then I started putting um, things in place. And then there's a little story of that. And in fact, Justice Bernie Stevenson was the judge who officially signed off. Again, I'll always be thankful to her um, on Nathan's adoption. Mm -hmm. And so he, although I got him, um, that was 19th of May, I got him like a week later to that date, um, he officially became Henry on 17th of December 2010. So I celebrate that, but he doesn't really know yet why fully, although he knows he's adopted, but I, why he, I. I celebrate that day, so he has like two birthdays. Mm -hmm. um, his real birthday, which is the 24th of July, and um, that birthday of 17th. And why I was able to name him, what happened was that when we found out, he had not yet been registered. Okay. And so I got the opportunity to name him. And so I named him Nathan, his biblical name, Omasi, which is his African name, in honor of his great God. And I kept Kenrick because I said your past cannot be erased. True. And I named him after my father, Elkin. So it's Nathan Obasi, Kendrick Elkin here. What child, what kind of child is Nathan? How old is he now? Nathan is 11. 11. Oh, I've met Nathan. Nathan. Oh yes, I've I've met Nathan, Nathan. is a handful and a half, trust me. <laughs> Nathan is my biggest challenge. <laughs> Nathan challenges me in all ways. But he is a, he's rambunctious. Sometimes I tell you, just watching the boy gets me tired, although now he's coming down, I must say, he he is he has a although he has this like brava don like he's rough and so on, but he has a very he's a very sensitive child. He feels things very deeply, and so that is something I have to manage. That because he's so like loud and everything, people will really. So I'm like a defender, right? Because I know he hurts yes. and he's very sensitive. Right. He's a very caring child. I mean, he's quite loving. Um, but he is a very independent thinker. He challenges me. He uses my own words against me, my own rules against me. So, and there's a little joke. He was maybe less than about two-ish. And I, I still don't drink. But if he goes to a party, I will, I, you know, I would make a fuss. But I never gave him soft drinks. And, but I love a red quenchy. <laughs> so I would sneakily drink my little red quenchy occasionally. And one day, I thought Nathan was in his bed. And after my, a whole long day, I sat in that kitchen. I took out that red quenchy from the freezer. I put that in a glass. I sat on my little chair. And I'm about to take my first seat. I could taste that quenchy already. And Nathan says, this little part of it, and he has a big voice. I said, like, no, put it down. It's not good for you. It's unhealthy. Right now, put it down. Is that what you say to him? That's what I went to yes. him. I said, No, you can't have surgery because it's not good for you. It's unhealthy. So he used the same, but he was just about two. And I had no choice but to but throw to that down. down that sink. And I was like, yeah. But you have to practice on yes, the bridge, you yes, know? So, yes, um, yes. Do, yeah. Do you plan on, on adopting again? Is that ah, something? Listen, I'm too old for that. You too. Um, <laughs> but. I almost had a second child, mm -hmm. and I just right now I'm the surrogate mother, right? Because Nathan has a sister. In fact, I was there when she was born and everything. And when she was 20 days old, her mother called me. I was doing a session, and I ended up quite late, and I saw all these missed calls. And the mom, she saw that she left her patient, so I need to come and get the child. And so you need to come and get the child. Yeah. And so I got to Sufre at midnight that night. Because I saw that message at me quite late. And when I got home, it was 2 o'clock and I had a baby in hand. A little girl, 20 days old. And I called my sister Catherine, who lives in New Jersey, and within two days, cat out free at the max. On FedEx came everything you could possibly need for a baby. Oh. I still have a car seat to give away, right? Because I've already got used. A car seat, some plate, and all kinds of clothes. So and beautiful, beautiful, beautiful things. But then some persons in Sufria told her she should not give me the child because I already have a son. So she came back to get the baby a few days later. And 
and then she brought back the baby another few days later. Then she came back to get what? the baby a few days later. And then she came back like three times and nothing interesting, he said nothing. Which was strange because when that baby came the first day, they even got up when I called him at two o'clock. And he was so excited and he was so protective of this baby. And you know, we brought the baby cries, he was rolling, and so I'm up and Nathan is up with me, and so he was four at the time. And I always said if she had stayed with us, he would have been a much calmer child. Mm -hmm. And then when the third time when the baby went back, Nathan said to me, but because I did not get the baby through, say, the government official, because mm -hmm. she had promised to go to the police and say, I kidnap a child and all of that stuff. So at that point, I handed back the child. Uh -oh. And I said to her then, because then for the third time when the baby went back, said to me, Mommy, why is this baby always going back? And I said, you know what, God, I had no children. I was content because I always said for my nieces and nephews, especially sick and then when I had my children, I just didn't give birth to them. And you've blessed me with a child. So the child I have to protect is the one you gifted mm -hmm. me with. I'm not going to be selfish and greedy. Mm -hmm. I'm content. And I said to her, because I said, if no, he's asking, it means it's playing with him, it's mm -hmm. mine. And I need to protect that. And I said to her, listen, the next time you bring back this baby here, She's not coming back to you. You can jump up, you can jump down, you can call police, you can... I don't care. The next time, that child is not going back. And she never really brought the baby back. But the baby got burnt. And in the welfare, and then sometimes I think about it, and I said, maybe she wasn't meant to be with us. And she got burnt, and then Naomi took her to her aunt. I mean, it works with me. Yes. Vincia, my cousin in Mao, who did such a fantastic job. If you see her, you never know she was burnt. And then she goes to my aunt, my cousin, and she wanted that baby back. And she Again. Her. Oh, yes, and she goes up and everything like that. And then she went to welfare to say that she has this baby and she needed, you know, help. And then welfare took the child to bring to me. But I was out of state. Okay. And then Naomi had the baby to go down with. And then I came back, and then when they came back again, I was out of state. But by which time, Naomi, and at the time her boyfriend had gotten attached, she had no children. And I just felt Let them. dead, because I was see yeah. her, so I'd take on holidays, and yeah. she'd spend long holidays with us and so on. So she still was fine. Okay. And then, closer to a year, Ava asked me, and even Naomi, and I just said, no, I think she's been with them so long. Yeah. She really loves them, and she's very attached, that, no, I didn't think it was. Mm -hmm. But she has been with us now, um, staying for what, from August, because Naomi is not here. And um, until Naomi returns, she is with us. Oh, so interesting. Like mother. Yes, you so, are indeed. Um, if it's not too personal to ask, um, Doc, along the way, is it that you opted not to have biological children? What, if you, if you do not mind no, sharing? That's, that's okay. Um, I always said, if I was, since I was a child, I didn't want any children wasn't married that was and that kind of came to me when I was in first form and I just don't understand why I wasn't aware of that before but anyhow when I was in first form there were two children they were sisters they think, but they had different surnames and I could not comprehend how they were sisters with different surnames and I kept asking I said but how is that possible and this is girl Sharon play I have not seen Sherry Pierce since second form because she left and went to England. Sherry Pierce was from Granby. If anybody knows Sherry Pierce and tell Sherry Pierce, I'm looking for her. And Sherry Pierce said, no, nah, because her mother had sex with two people, different people. That's, That's like that. Sisters. With two different people. And I just couldn't wrap my mind. I said, well, I really wouldn't want that. Mm -hmm. Because after all, home, we all have all the same surname. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what, then to avoid that, then I'll have no children unless I'm married. I was 10 years old and I said that. And I never deviated from that even in my old age. Mm -hmm. But you've had boyfriends and so on. I've had two boyfriends in my lifetime. What? And, <laughs> but I always maintained that I was not going to have any children if I did not. If you were not married. And I know it sounds old fashioned, everybody says that, but you know, that's, that's it. And so that's it. So you never got married? No, so I never, never got married. I was, not that I wasn't asked um, to be married, but I never got married. Yeah. 
Um, I was asked to be married, but at the time I thought he was too young and we had things to do and you know, we needed to do more. And of course, by the time that happened, the friend came and la la la, long story, 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 story. So <laughs> that's that, you know? And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and like my friend is saying, there's nothing wrong with that. I know because I'll tell you though, but I never felt I missed anything. Colleen, I Are you sure it. No, I'm positive, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> I always said, and I've said that, I've said that at the beginning. I was uh, very close to my nieces and nephews. I have some of my godchildren, um, Claire Servitu and Rajiv, who I have. These children, I have considered to be my children. And Carlin Richards used to always give me a little pressure, especially when I came back in 2001 with my PhD. Oh, you need to get things. That's been very selfish vibe. I can hear her. You, you it's a very <laughs> powerful voice yes. giving you that you lecture. Know? And you know, but you need to have a child. And I was like, Carlin, no, I don't need to have a child. I don't feel it. Mm -hmm. I used to always say to them, when I was at ECCB, I didn't know, I had this friend. And she's like, well, Dad, no, I'm going to have a child because, you know, look at my age. She was like in her 30s. She said, you know, my clock, I tell her, well, maybe I didn't get a clock, my clock is about <laughs> I truly never felt the need or the urge to have children. Though I always said it would have been nice, I used to say when we were six, four, if I was having children, I'd like to have twins, you know, but although I said no, because I'd like to get pregnant twice, just to go through the experience, you know. But I never had that urge and that need, because I always said to them, I had my children already. I just hadn't given birth to them. Mm -hmm. My Kondwani and, and Sekani. It's interesting that you say Kondwani and I just see him coming up there. Kondwani is watching. Yes, because yeah. I lived with them. I started living with them when I was 13, if Kondwani knew. So when they were born and so forth. Kondwani, I always say to him, is the child, the person who taught me that you can love more than one person deeply. Because when our first um, Sekani was born, that is Kondwani's. And he was first son. Mm -hmm. And although we had other neighbors, but again, that was, that was like when the first child we were actively involved in. And we all wanted a girl. And I was in third form when Sekani was born. I remember I went to the hospital and um, Lucy John Baptist, her sister Teresa, at the time had a girl. So they were born on the same day. So in school, she's because we were all talking about this niece or nephew we were expecting. And so she come like teasing me about that she has a niece. And I had a boy, and I was like, okay, I really wanted a little girl and so on. But when I got to that hospital that afternoon, October 8th, 1978, and I saw Sekani, my heart melted. Oh. And it didn't matter whether he was a girl or boy, I just fell in love with that little boy. He's now a man, and I love that child. And then Connie got pregnant with Conway and Sekani shortly after because Conway was born in February 1980. And when Connie got pregnant, I'm really out of what I know about it after mm -hmm. And I said, Connie, I really don't know about this, you know. You're on your own with the second child. I mean, how would you want to make a second child so soon? But you're not easy, though. You're not easy. You know, I'm like 40, <laughs> you 40 40 out of one is a big lady, married lady. Hey. And I'm saying, I don't know, you're all on your own you know, with the second child. Mm -hmm. And then Conway was born. And then after hurricane, he got hepatitis because of, you know, the arms. And then when I saw Kondwani... You fall in love again. Oh, my heart melted. And I said, it's possible to love more than one person. It's possible to love more than one child, mm -hmm. deeply. Mm -hmm. And they're all different, but you love them the same. Mm -hmm. And so these are my children. Mm -hmm. My friends will tell you, everywhere I went, I had a bag, because I had Sekhan and Kondwani. Until when Kondwani was studying, a girl is arguing with Kondwani that I am his mother. And she says, no. And he said, yes, I'm telling you, Vaga had two children, mm -hmm. two boys. She always had them everywhere she went. He said, no, that's my aunt. Uh -huh. Arguing, Kondwani had to call me to talk to her. To, to clarify. Lucy, Lucy mm -hmm. is her aunt. Mm -hmm. I am Kondwani's aunt. But um, Doc, so is it is it fair to say that you're quite content right now with your son Nathan and no husband and my sister Cleo will tell you, and that's one of the things she has always said about me as a child. I'm a very contented person. Mm -hmm. I don't have everything I desire or want, but I am always thankful for whatever I have. And I think my father, I think I must give credit to, and my sister, 
Connie. My father used to always say to us to focus on our education. He said, listen, men and sex run in nowhere. They will always be there. Mm -hmm. Focus on your, on your own self and being you. Secure in your own person. And my sister Connie kind of reinforced that message. And so I have never felt this great desire. Why, yes, I think it might be nice to have a husband. But I'm sometimes, I think more than not, I think I am quite happy um, being single and on my own, to be honest. I tell them, you know, when you're single, you don't have to worry about who is cheating, not cheating, who is doing this, you know. Sure. You just move in your nice little happy world. And no, I am content, to be quite honest. Your family is a very well known family name in Dominica. Thank um, you very yes. So let us talk about where this all began. Well, my father, Elvin Bernard Henry, and my mother, Ilma Charles Henry. My mother's actually from La Plaine originally, although we don't know much of my mother's family, except her close um, sisters from her mother's end. Mm -hmm. um, and that's Auntie Vony, that's Uncle Asinor, that's Uncle Tomb, and Uncle Gudo. And they're not all deceased, may they rest in peace. But this, our aunts from our mother's side, these aunts and uncles, especially after my mom passed, they always, as I always say, they didn't have money to give us. Mm -hmm. But what they gave us in love, care, and protection, there's no money that could provide that or that can take its place. And so my father, we have met, my mother has 11 children and the last of the 11 of my mother's children was my father's wife. But my father also has numerous other children. Mm. From, and I, I always say, these were not flings, these were good relationship because it's by threes and fours and fives. But we grew up as one, because my father always said he had no half children. All he had were children. Children. And so we always had big family gatherings. I think my mother um, also facilitated that because a number of them stayed with us. In fact, I had two brothers who I followed my mother's children until I got much older. And, you know, my mother had this shop. I always say, you know, we had maybe one of the first department stores, the sign of the king shop. And a lot of my other siblings, not my mother's children, would work there. They would be at home. And so my mother entertained and welcomed all of them. And so, and my father. She and so, a, and to this day, she had a good heart. we have our family gatherings at Christmas, Easter, at the summer, you know, New Year's. And we all look out for each other. So there is no half brother and a half sister. We are just sisters and, and brothers. brothers. And my father was, one of the things I say to people, I remember well of my father. My father never really, like, I never got beaten. And most of us never got beaten. My father's punishment was to send you to kneel. But he was very forgetful. So sometimes as soon as he gets up, you give him a few minutes and you walk down after him. But once he caught me, he said, by the way, you're going back. You know? And, but my father spoke a lot. Well, it's not long lectures. I find myself doing long lectures. I said, but my father always spoke in little things. And my father loved language. And my, I, I think my father is the greatest orator of all time. So. And, you know, and the Shakespeare's and so on. That's how we, he would speak, you know, and tell us about, you know, um, those who toil in the night and stuff like that. The little bird catches the worm and things. And, you know, give us lessons through that. I think my father had as well grounded. My father, as I said to them, very that man, but my father's a farmer, was a farmer. Many things, but he was a farmer. And so we had to go up in the country every summer for at least two weeks. To, and then he'd take you around the field and he said, do you see a money tree somewhere? Do you see money tree? Do you see money? No. He said, no, there's no money tree to shake. So no, I'm just asking for stuff. Mm -hmm. And we all had to work. So I was little, very little. And I had to carry my little bananas when it was banana day. I can't carry a bunch, but I can carry a hand. Mm -hmm. And when it's grapefruit day, I can't carry a crate of grapefruit, but I can carry three grapefruits in a box. 
And so I carried my frigate fruits, I carried my little hand, and so everybody would. You made your contribution. Yes. Small and I think was. what that did for us is instill a strong work ethic. I don't think anybody has voted for Henry and they can say that that Henry is lazy, is, lazy, is uh, you know, not a good worker, doesn't strive for excellence, because my father is always said to us. And my sister Connie reinforced that all the time. Anything worth doing is worth doing well. well. And if you're not going to do it well, then don't do it, you know? And so that carried on. And in terms of what honesty and integrity and standing for what you believe, you know? Um, Tell me a little bit more about your siblings. Most of them we know. Well, At least most of those we know. All right, so I know you have quite a bit. So. So my <laughs> eldest sister is Connie. And so I was about to ask you, is Connie the eldest? Because you, you reference her yeah, a Connie lot. Connie is our mother. Connie is substituted. And when you think about it, Ephrodina, and as I always say, when we speak of Connie, we cannot leave out His Excellency. Mm -hmm. yes. Connie came back from studying her first degree in 1975. And Connie took on mothering us. Because your mother had passed. My mother had passed. My mother passed in 1972. Okay. Connie was out in Jamaica studying. Okay. So when she returned, she just because by then Cleo, which is our second eldest sister, who is in um, Sweden now, she's the president of the World Marriage and University. Hmm. Um, she was out studying at Caveville. So Connie was the one who took care of us and assumed. And I mean, I say to people, I, I had a, we had a good, when you talk about it, we had a good childhood. Connie, although when you think now you get older, when you got older, you realize that all the little salary went to her to support us. Mm -hmm. But she never made us feel like we were burdens. And, you know, so what do you say? And how do you ever repay that person? You can't. And then he knew the husband. And even when he was a boyfriend, even she was away studying. He would I tell people I know a lot of Dominica from Eliod. Because he would come on a Sunday and he was a cooperative officer, you know, they're going on to the different cooperatives, and I would go along with him. There was no holiday that Eliud didn't come to take us out on a picnic. And at the time, Julius, and what was Julius surname, Jesus? He's passed now. And because at one point, Julius was like, Cleo's little boyfriend, but that didn't go too far, too long. But <laughs> notwithstanding that they were, had broken up, he would, they would come. And like Pentecost, Easter, August, Monday, mm -hmm. we were out on picnics, you know. And um, after they got married, one time, all of us, the last four girls, all of us lived with Corn and I, And I mean, that was in their young married life. Wow. But you know, that's and, incredible. And then, for a man to yes, and so I take always this used to say, and I've said that before, that if I have two daughters, and I used to say if I had two dollars, and if you wanted one, and my father wanted one, I'd give one each. If I had one dollar, and if you wanted it, and my father wanted it, I'd give it to you. Wow. Why? Because my my father did he have to do? Because I'm his child. Yes. What he did, he didn't have. To you didn't do have to at all. Four of your sisters. Yeah. Lived with them. Yes. I mean, four of you. All. Of us. Yeah. And um, that's what that, that, that. so you know, so family is really important to us, I, or to me. I, I and when some of my friends, you know, they get upset and they say, "Oh, they take advantage of you, blah blah blah." But you know what? And now that Connie is not so well, I just see that it's me that must carry on that mantle. Yeah. And so every Sunday, I. Because I think Connie you ought not to be going out to eat every Sunday. And um, because I growing up as a child, Sunday meal was always huge and big. Connie loved cooking, she was a great cook. And um, no, so I couldn't. And just like when my father was ill, and you know, my father last years, and that's one of the reasons I came back and stayed. And after he died, I said I could move on, and but I never did. I stayed and even came along, and I guess that was the end of that. Um, for me, I see sometimes people talk about how their parents being burdens and things like that. For me, taking care of my father or being there for him was an honor. That's so noble. I felt privileged 
that I got the opportunity to give back. And I think we all did. Because all my siblings, I don't know, and my father used to say that, I used to say, boy, because our neighbor, I tell you, Auntie Liz and her children, Lucinda, Alfred, Hesca, Badwill, and so on, Hesca, Chatter, um, for me, these are like remarkable people because they took immaculate care of their mother. And I used to say, when you know that, yeah, because I used to go down to every day to my uncle to see my father. And sometimes I tell them they're tired. I wish I would level up at 12 o'clock. So instead of talking to daddy, I dare sleep because my father had a bed, Cleo had sent for, you know, like the hospital bed, you can adjust it and so on. It was as if that had become my bed. Huh? And so my father was on in her bed and I'm on that bed adjusting it and so my father but he used to say, no, 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 that's bad, that's bad. And when I said, boy, daddy, hey, last, I'm not nice. No, I come in and I'm so tired. All I'm doing is sleeping, you know. I'm, and he's, my father said to me, but rather you are here. That's what matters. You are here. Yeah. And then I said, boy, your children. He said, my children, I can ask for nothing more for my children. My children have all busy lives. But if all of their busy lives, they have never forgotten they have a father. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when my father died in 2005, I have no regrets. Um, and I still have no regrets. But I will tell you, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I saw always tease my father. I used to say, boy, daddy, when you die, I never worry about that because I'm so used to dealing with death. At five years, Julie died. Six years, my mother died. And so along the way, good friends, my brother Clement, when I was like, what, 20? I said, Daddy, I'm good with them. Dev and I, we have good friends. And my father just used to smile. He said, oh, we'll see about that, Father. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, when my father died, that sent me in a tailspin. I could not work. My father died July 20th, 2005. And I didn't, I just couldn't focus. All I was doing was cleaning. I was cleaning like a maybe a demented woman. And it was not until, and I will never forget that Calypso, um, first Calypso, uh, kind of sleep, so it was October what, 20th, October something. It was on that day I started working again. Because that day before I'd gone to my father's gravesite, and I said, Daddy, let me tell you something. You need to organize yourself up there. <laughs> because I have to organize myself. No, and yeah. I'm not able to organize yeah. myself. And I said, I know you don't want me to starve, you know. But if I carry on that way, I will starve because mm -hmm. I have given up projects because I just could not get this thing. So I gave up projects. I said, I need to get back to work. And he must have heard me. He must have organized himself up there because that next day, I worked all through until like 6 o'clock the next morning. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And that's it. That's it. Um, Doc, let's talk about um, your, 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 some of your childhood days. And it's interesting. We're talking about childhood at 908. Uh, <laughs> we still have quite a bit to talk, talk about with um, Dr. Henry. Um, so tell me about your childhood days and um, your education within that time. Well, I grew up in Mao. My child. So is that where you are? I was born in Mao. You were born in Mao. I always say to people, I'm a real Shaman, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. The other people were born in Rozo, they brought them down to Mao. With me. <laughs> I was born in the village. You know where the Rozo, the Mao market is? At the time, my parents lived in a house there until my father built this house and then we moved. To where? We moved like a few streets, a few. Oh, say me down. Say Mao, don't say Mao. Okay. I'm never going to say a block down the road mm -hmm. when my father built this house. And so I was actually born at home on a Monday midwife, morning. Midwife, midwife? I guess a midwife mm -hmm. on a Monday morning. And my brother Edgar, they said when he came and he saw this most beautiful baby, he fell in love with her instantly. He didn't want to go to school the next day because he wanted to stay to look after his little baby sister. So yes, that's why I was born. I went to Teacher Joseph um, preschool. Mm -hmm. And when I was about four, I left and I went to Marvel Government School. That's a little story with that. Because one day, at four years old, I remember that like yesterday, but I guess my family repeated that story so many times, so I guess it's part of my memory bank. But I swear I remember that. I went to school one afternoon, and again, we were doing one, two, buckle my shoes, three, three four, four, shut the, the door, door, five, six, six. seven, eight, five, eight, seven, eight. I said, lay them straight. I said, listen, 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 I've had enough of this. So I told the teacher that I wasn't feeling well and I needed to go back home to teach her. And I went, she sent me back home. And I went and I said to my mother, I'm really not sick. You know. I am just tired of going to that school and I need to go to big school. 
I mean, when you said, what value you just for? I'm like, I remember that conversation. I said, I need to go to big school. She said, but how am I going to do that? I said, I mean, how? You just take me up to the school and you go and talk to the lady and I go to big school. You're seriously? And my mother, right, what do I even really tell you? I'm a case from ever. And my father and my mother said, but we have to pass to Church Joseph's school. I said, yeah, we just go in and I'll tell her I told her a little feeble. And I promised to come to see her every day after school. And I actually kept that promise. And so we did, and my mother's feeling never. So we gone to school, and Mrs. Delon, you see the Delon's mother, was the principal of Marrow School at the time. And so when we get there in that afternoon, she says well, she has no space because there's no desk and no chair. And I said, but that's not a problem. Because at preschool, I have my own desk and my own chair <laughs> that my father had built for me, which was the truth. I said, no, we'll just go down on our way to the preschool and we'll take this chair and the desk and we'll How come back. How old were you? I was four years old. And we'll come back and, and she says, well, I said, just put me on the front of the class somewhere. And that's how I got to primary school. And then gone, whatever it was called. Mrs. Deloney, Mama Joseph was my teacher. I have a little story of Mama Joseph. I remind her all the time. So, the following summer, the... the the December, yeah. the Friday. You're leaving me literally speechless. Uh, uh, um, you know, Christmas play, and she takes me to be like the lead singer. No master shanty. <laughs> no matter how she tries to get me to stay in tune, it's not happening. And when his neighbor Joseph sees her concert is approaching, and this star is not getting it. She puts me down and she takes my cousin Marilyn John, who's in Florida now. And Marilyn could sing. And I said, I'm shattered. <laughs> you know, when I see them, I tell her, oh my God, I'm shattered, I'm broken. <laughs> you know? I'm I down. Don't sing. <laughs> I but I love singing, so I was always singing. And my father, that's why we have that starving story in our family. And my father used to say to me, Mother, please leave school. Because, alas, if it's singing you want to take as a career, you, you starve. starve. And I don't want any of my children to starve. <laughs> and I mean, yeah, and I was that. And so I went to school. I skipped a lot. Eh? Stage one to stage two. Then I got, I didn't do grade one. I went to grade two, then grade four, then grade six. And I'm not surprised. And I was in convent high school. There's a story of that too. And so I enjoyed my mom school days. And people like Joan Smurphy. The genius, and I mean, I don't think there's anybody who's more genius than Joan Murphy Jr. Um, and Albert Murphy's brother, who all in, in, in together. Joan, um, Jones got the Iron Scholar that year, that was 1975, and everyone thought I would have gotten a scholarship. And what oh, you our did not know, our principal was Mr. King, who was our cousin, and um, he just passed actually in class. And he what he wanted to call call ministry to have a review because it was like impossible. Mm -hmm. And then they were saying to my father, since I was only nine, going on ten, I should stay back. Hmm. But guess who was having none of it? You. Me. So I said, stay back to the Because work. you didn't get a scholarship. Get a scholarship. I said, no, 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 I'm passed. And I'm going to convent. So when my father goes to register me, convent say no, because I'm young and for them always a pass I have. I said, listen, my father say bye. Our sister Catherine was going to grammar school and Josephine and Catherine and I were really close. I said, Why? I told people that my I had Catherine was my best friend until I got to foot form and I got another best friend. Oh Jesus. And Convent said no. And my father said, well, okay. And he went back and said, Well daddy, you didn't try hard enough. You go back to the people. And but, but, say, but, 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 but. And then he said, Well, I just go to grammar school. I said, No, 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 I'm not going to grammar school. I made up I told you I'm going to convent, and that's what I've always said. So I will not be going to grammar school. I will not be going to any other school but convent. But convent. And I will not be going back to repeat grade six. I am going to school come September. And my father said, but they know me saying. Well, I said, well, I should get asthma. Well, I started getting asthma attacks. And I said to my father, so you're going to make your child die because a nun says she can't accept her? Daddy, you need to go back. You are not trying hard enough. You said that to your father? Yes. And somehow, I don't know what he did. But I got into convent, September 1975. So yes. So yes. How was convent? Oh, convent was wonderful. I had my ups and my downs, but I enjoyed me. I'm a person. I make the best. I bloom wherever I'm planted. 
And I will say to you, and I want to say that I think I said, I said that in 20, 2002, Convent asked me to do the, the little, um, you know, the little address, they do mm -hmm. at the graduation, mm -hmm. the little feature address. Mm -hmm. And I did say that. Because in Convent, I was an African, maybe that's why I shot the best. For me in Convent, once I got a 70, I was okay. So that's why I, mean, I, I don't want so to. So that's be like there. a B. A, a well, 70 is just borderline A. B, 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 B plus. B plus B. I was good at that. So I always said, I don't think many of my teachers ever dreamt that I would be Dr. Henry. Mm -hmm. Because. I was not in the top one. Mm -hmm. I was not in the top two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. I know it wasn't even in the top ten. Uh oh. I was so you're somewhere in the middle of, then. Oh, somewhere hanging you know, out. The fifteen there. Enjoy my God. <laughs> and but I but all but strangely I always knew I was going to be Doctor Henry. Mm -hmm. And so when people were saying their things, I never bought into that because that wasn't me. People were saying what they wanted, but I knew who I was. Mm -hmm. I think I've always had a good, had a good spirit. Of self and yes. spirit. Very confident. Yes, I've always, High self -esteem. I've always had that. You know? And when I left, I think where I came into my own was when we got to six form. Because again, I wanted to graduate so much. Oh, I did my best. And by the time real exams come now, I feel so tired. If I pick up a book, I'm fast asleep. <laughs> So I did not do very well in O levels either. Oh, interesting. No, I with didn't. all of those degrees that you have, no, that we're going to talk about you, in a while. I'm way. telling you, I did. I got four subjects. Yes, there were ones and twos, but four subjects. Not sufficient. And you needed five mm -hmm. to go to six. Mm -hmm. Well, guess including who? math and English. Yes, but I had math basic two, and, and at that time they used to like basic two thing. But so maths, they would accept the basic. Math was a joke because so when you add maths basic two, I had five, but really math basic two. <laughs> so for computation, those people I have A for answer, I have A, but for reasoning they have NA. You don't understand. I have the answers correct, but the reasoning to get to the answer, the people had no clue how I got the answers correct. <laughs> So anyhow, I go, so Cody says, well, Lana, you have to go back. I said, me? No, no, no. Mr. Andrew used to be born. He be born. An African mm -hmm. was on principal at, at six form at the time. So I said, oh, no, Cody, when you're going to do that registration, I'm going to come with you. So some of I can go. I said, no, no, no. I am coming with you to do the registration. So we went. So he says, you be boy saying, but you know, it needs some five and, you know, I say, Mr. Evie, well, let me tell you something. These grades do not define who I am. That's not me. These are grades. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you how I got that. I was so tired trying to graduate to make sure I can get to that ball. That if you look, I have very good grades. Mm -hmm. That's why I get to the ball. Mm -hmm. That by the time I came to really study for that real exam, I'm too tired. But that's not me. These grades do not define who I am. I'm going to tell you, you, I am ready for a level. And so he said, I said, well, okay, let us compromise. In January, I'll do two subjects. You're negotiating. Yeah. Two subjects. And I will pass these two subjects. And so before the school day is over, I will have met the minimum requirement of the five. I, in fact, I'll have six. Because mm -hmm. I said, I know why they, they call it. I know for state college, you're not six, or you're not accepting mm -hmm. that basic mm -hmm. two. But, and that was what happened. None of my six month friends believed I didn't have these subjects because I was in all too bad at and everything like that. And I did do sociology and principles of business in the January. I did pass them with A's mm -hmm. and that was the end the rest of that. Mm -hmm. And so you I, never settled. Clearly, from what you've been sharing with us so far on this program, it is clear that it is clear that you never settled and you never accepted anyone telling you no, no you could not. And even now you can see that. And so when you say this is the last year has been like that for a long time, it's not her fault. And I got my I got my past my oil levels. So you knew from there. That you had the potential to get. I always knew that even from no child. Because remember, I was supposed to be one of the brightest children mm -hmm. in my own primary school. I was in the top two, mm -hmm. top three. But to still, but and I, and I, and I still get a pass. And I still get a pass. So that's why I tell children, 
And I tell parents when they're trying to die because they're cheering, that doesn't define that is the future mm -hmm. of your child at mm -hmm. all. Clearly, and you're a good example of doesn't that. doesn't define your child. Because your child is not defined by an A or B or C. That's mm -hmm. not what defines who your child parents, is. Parents, I hope you're listening. You understand? And then, six form, two of the best years of my life. They will go down as two of the best years. My sister called used to say, anyway, if you don't get this levels, you can't say you didn't enjoy six form, eh? Because we did, we had so many things. We used to have cookouts and fets and we had bars running at Chris, a carnival and all of that good stuff. Dr. Mark Thompson, um, Helen Mello, Eleanor Philip, Paul Philip, Diane Francis, Jason James, you know, Wayne Lybert was a year below us, but you know, Jennifer Julian, Candy, um, Richards, Glenda Landa, you know, that group of persons, Eddie Bruno and so on. Gosh, Jesus, this was just, we just had, we care, I think, into ourselves. And then that was six form. And then after six form, I went to teach at Community High School for two years. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, my first job I got was to teach at convent. And I actually had my books and everything. The same convent? Same convent High School, yeah. But I, Mrs. Levy was the principal then. And I really wanted to teach history because I loved history. But she didn't give me history to teach. I had Spanish, I had physical education, I had English and something else. And I was like, please give me history, please. And she didn't give me history, but Harry Mello, who didn't know history at 11, got to teach history. Ha! Huh. <laughs> and then Comedy High School called me. And Celia Nicholas, who's also my godmother, and my subjects that to teach at Comedy High School was history, principles of business, English, physical education. Because I used to be an athlete. No, right. I don't look like an athlete, but mm -hmm. I used to be an athlete. I used to be a meter. Four and eight hundred meters. And I was so happy with that. And then the best part, it started at nine, nine to two. So I went back and I handed Mrs. Lee with his books. I told her, thank you for the opportunity, but I'm going. And she's like, you're going to come to high school work yet? Why? I said, two reasons. One, it starts at nine. And I'll tell you, when I was in high school, I used to always say, I don't want any job starting at eight. Because that was just so much stress on my heart, trying to get ready to beat at school on time. And I got to teach history. I loved, and my love for history was always there. And when we went three, six, four, Henry Vaughan was our history teacher, and you know something? Because he said the only time I got to school early was if I had to present. Mm -hmm. So I'm a good teacher, maybe Henry Vaughan needs to get most of the credit for that. And so what he would do is give the topics, and we were the ones, the students, who went to present the topics. Mm -hmm. and I mean, he was there to guide, to make, make sure we were not teaching the wrong things. But you got to teach. I said... I suspect as a student, I would have loved as a, as a student, I would have loved to be, um, love you to be my teacher. I think my for whatever reason, I think my students I think make it fun. Yes, I was a fun teacher. My students loved me. I was strict, you know, but I was fun. But I was very strict. But I know why I had to be strict because when I went to teach at Quincy High School, I was really very tiny, and some of the children, even in first form, were older than I was. By the time they got to food from they were my age or older. Mm -hmm. And so very early I had to set like the, 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 the bar. Mm -hmm. So what I would accept mm -hmm. and what I would not accept. And I would say to them, they can what they can depend on is that I will always come to class prepared. I'll never come to teach them unprepared. I will be there to listen, I'll be there to do this and that. But they had their part to fulfill. And I held them to that, and I think they held me to that. And I mean, I remember the first one, Pearl, um, Pearl Joseph, um, she was Pearl Centile then, remembers that, and she still reminds me of that occasionally. When in first form, the, the first term, I am presenting the children their grades, their results, and I had two children who had failed, you know, like they got a new NSAs. And in talking to them about, you know, to encourage them to know to do better and so on. I'm saying, you know, your parents have made so many sacrifices and so on. And then all you lo and behold, I started to cry. I mean, big bulb of tears. 
I got so caught up in this. And I was like, oh, Jesus. But I couldn't contain it. It just came out. And I'm just saying, you know, the sacrifices your parents are making. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is come to learn. And you are not learning. And blah, 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 whatever. whatever. Pearl reminds me of that. All the time. Okay, well, not all the time. She probably so. reminds me. <laughs> and so I've taught quite a lot of students who still, I think my students still regard me as maybe one of their best teachers. Miss, this Miss Boney that did all of the magic at St. Martin's School that was, was one of my students. You know, Catherine John, Pearl, um, Clarence Hodge, Cornfields, Constance. I taught um, um, Curtis Matthew. Oh, in the film. <laughs> uh, because Curtis Matthew, the year he was graduated, had an accident, so he came back to the film. Okay. And I taught him, I taught um, Morancy, Ronald Charles, Jeff Charles, Reginald Antoine, um, Dennis Faustine, um, a bunch of my children, Celestine, um, what was Celestine's surname again, Jesus, from Massac, um, Judith, Celia, poorly daughter of, um, Cousins Billy Ref, and she's in Antigua now. So yes, I, I, and you I remember I, them well. Of course I remember them well. well. Because they remember me, they see me, I'm Davidson, and there's a little story of Davidson, Davidson, I hope you don't mind. Um, because Davidson, brother, was focusing or is focused. I don't know if Pocus is still alive. And at the time, Pocus was the most wanted mm -hmm. in Dominica. Mm -hmm. And I think some teachers feared that because Davidson, and I think Davidson used that too. So I had a little rule that when, and because Agri used to be right after my history class. And sometimes if they have an agri test, they want to be like studying in history. And I said, listen to me, anytime I find a book that's not history, I'm taking it. And to get it back, you must pay the cost of the book to the school fund. And so one day, Mr. Davidson had his little agri book inside of my history book, which I got. So Davidson says to me, you get Poco sale from you. <laughs> I say, Poco? Who is Poco sale? You mean you? I said, I'll go and get it. No, I tremble in my little picture. I said, Davidson, you go and get Poco sale. Tell him I'm waiting for him. Because I know if he's so bad and brave, the police waiting. Tell him just walk down to the police station. So when he's ready, tell him I am waiting for him. I'm not afraid of Poco, much as for sale. Sure. No, I am shaking, you know, when Davidson can see that from my hand. But I'll tell you that story of Davidson. Davidson is one of my heartwarming stories. And when I was going, and anyway, I talked to Davidson and so on and so forth. And when I was leaving to study, there was a wailing at the back of the line, started by Davidson. And the rest of the children started crying. And I never forget that. Because Davidson said to me, You know, who are you leaving me for? When you go to study, who are you leaving me for? You are the first teacher who believed in me. And I promised him that I would check on him every time I came back. And I did. You did. To this day, Davidson see me still is Miss Henry, full respect. And when he got his first little girlfriend, well, I know this first little girlfriend, but he had a little girlfriend, a convent high school girl in it. And he says, Miss, I need you to meet. I have a convent girl. I said, I hope you take good care of the person's convent girl. <laughs> and make sure she doesn't get pregnant. <laughs> and they have a son, and um, yeah, to full respect. To so, so that was your teaching beat at Community High School. I'm going to take a little break for yes. you. Um, Doc, allow me to have some, some water, topic. some topic of water. Thank you again, Josephine Gabriel and company. I'm going to play one of the songs that you love um, while we just take a short break here. And we're going to come right back. Yes. A very, very lively, interesting conversation with Dr. Walter Henry on the In the Spotlight radio show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Oh, I love that song. That was Sandy Scrum. They gave the horns that to you.
9.31, the time in the studios of Q95. This is the In The Spotlight radio show. Reminding you to follow us on our various platforms like our pages, the In The Spotlight radio show, the group by the In The Spotlight radio show. Follow my personal pages as well and public page. We also have our Triple F marketing and advertising page. Please patronize us. Follow and like. If you would like to make a contribution to the program to support us in any small way, you can do so via mobile banking, user ID 767-235-7565, account 1000-69592. And our PayPal is Fernanda Frampton at gmail.com. That's what we have for now until we establish some more. If you can assist, feel free to do so. What was the about the Sandy that crow was Sandy's own oh, that oh, year? Okay, somebody <laughs> said they won a Sandy crow. Yes, they did. They, they, they won a Sandy <laughs> crow. Boy, I make how much noise. Oh, I swear I wanted to fight them judges. <laughs> me, but my judges, you were coming to fight them. I was judges coordinator. Yeah. Oh, let me tell you. That that, that night, was the hunter had that little thing. And then hunter came out, take all his clothes and came back down. And voila, Sandy crow went up in the smoke. Well, Doc, let me tell you, you do not want to, I, I recall that night yelling at the judges, not because of who should have won and who shouldn't have won, we just could not get to the bottom oh, of this thing, oh, oh, and you have all these big men there, and, and, and I'm no, sitting here, and, and every time, I, it, that is one of the things that, in the Calypso world, and I think I always yes. felt that that yes. was the first thing yes. yes. that yes. song, yes. Yes. And I mean, that was a song they performed so flawlessly that night, you know. And uh, that's one of my all time favorite calypsos. But my all time, all time, all time favorite calypso. Well, I can, I can this say. This Crystal Fame by Padera. Yes. Yeah, all time favorite. All time favorite calypso. Because yeah. I think I resonated with the song, or the song resonated with me. Because uh -huh. you see, they don't know how hard you're working. Mm -hmm. Why are you there sleeping? You know, they're ready to say all kinds yes. of stuff, but you're there working, you yes, know. Yes. I think it's the words in that song. That kind of resonated with me, and that's my all time favorite. All time calypso. favorite calypso by Pat Aaron. Yeah, he, he sings it himself. He sings it himself. Yes. You know, Pat Aaron is the man who crowned many, many kings. Oh. He didn't crown himself, never got a crown. <laughs> um, but he is responsible for many kings. Yes, yes. That chess observer dies, Daryl. Hurricane, my favorite calypso. <laughs> Hurricane, um, you know. The breaks, he's a, he's just a talented yeah. man, and yeah. he's he's, he's a, a, a gift that God has given to oh, him. Yes, it is a gift, and um, you know, you just you cannot take that away from Pat Aaron, you cannot take that away from him no. at all. Good evening to you, sir, if you're tuned into the program. So, Valda, from teaching, the time is creeping up on us. From teaching, um, give us a summary of what you did from okay, there. Okay, so after that, I taught for two years at Comedy High School. I went on to University of the West Indies to read for my degree in management studies. At the time, I wanted to do econs and management, and he would say, what are you going to do when you come? You can call yourself an economist, you can call yourself a manager. So choose. <laughs> my father wanted me to do law, and I was like, Daddy, no, I could not do law because lawyers are liars, and I could not defend the person I know was guilty. No, it is ironic that years later I went to the bachelor's in law. And I'm telling you, I so enjoyed that. I just didn't have the time to devote as much to it. I'm not done the bar, but I have a bachelor's in law. Yes. And yes. I laughed when I started. I said, Daddy, you would be laughing at me. Because I tell you, had I done law in my youth, I would have been a formidable lawyer. I know that as a fact. Um, it is so interesting, you know. And so I did uh, management studies um, at KVL. I graduated the first class honors, the first first class honors in management studies from the time it was um, created from 1965. The first first class honors was me in 1988. From there, I came back to Dominica. I got a scholarship by UE to read an entry into a PhD, but I was bonded and uh, the government said I had to return, and I did. I stayed for three years. I was the coordinator of the administrative reform program. And 
And there's, there's stories for the two, but I'll just move along. No. You have to give me stories <laughs> for all the stories. It's just, I will be here all night. Yes. And, and they're already asking. We are not even done with the program yet. They're already asking for a part two. And <laughs> from that, I came. I worked for Frears in the establishment department. I moved on in like So pause, let's let's summarize the degrees. So you have an associate's degree. I have a, a, a BSc management studies. BSc management studies. I have a master's in business administration master's. from the from University of Manchester Business School. Uh -huh. I have a PhD in industrial relations and business from University of Warwick. I have a bachelor's of law from the University of London. I'm a chartered financial analyst. I'm a Global professional in HR. I'm a SHIELD senior certified professional. I'm an accredited director. I'm a ProNet trainer. And a few other things. The list read. goes on for somebody who got four CXC subjects. Because you see, a lot of us we get hung up on things, having degrees, a first degree or something. But that's not what defines you. Those mm -hmm. are accomplishments along mm -hmm. the way. But that's not who we are. Because I say to people, Take away all these degrees or all these things from me, I'll still be Valder Henry. So I always say to people, before whatever it is, that's why I don't get hung up on things. Because before this, I was Valder Henry. Mm -hmm. During it, I am Valder Henry. And after it, I will be Valder Henry. I am not defined by those things. And that is why there's this lady from Seoul, because when we were growing up, um, oh, I had a name, you know, he disappeared. Connie's mother. And you know, we always used to go by Sherry, that's like close family friends. And Elka. And every time she sees me in the market, I go and talk to Elka, I buy from Elka. And she says, But dog, Val, you haven't changed. You still come and talk to us. Why would I not talk to Elka? Because what? I'm Dr. Henry. Does that make sense? A person who I knew growing up, a person whose mother, I remember when my mother died, the lady, not those days, we had transport, came up and stayed with us for a very long time. Left her own children to come and look after us for you know to be with us. So my sister Finia went there for vacation many, many, many times. Why would I not? Why would that I not acknowledge and speak to these people that you, you know? know? So it's 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 I always say it's people who are not secure in who they are. Mm -hmm. And so they need the trappings to make them something or feel like they are something. But the trappings are accomplishments and they're great. Mm -hmm. But that's who you mm -hmm. are. And, and so for me, it's the same, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but you have accomplished a lot. I have. Um, in, in, in fact, you know, just this evening, I, I, I put a, a, a post on Facebook and I was saying, you know, that you're such an accomplished woman. And even for the program tonight, I was saying, well, there it is. I thought I was going to have a regular two-hour program with you, but it appears that you need a whole series, you know, based on, on you know, the thing. I'm serious, what you've achieved. I mean, all it takes to be a, you no, know, you could be a lawyer. You have a lawyer. A degree. Yeah. What, what would it take for you to be a lawyer? I used to go to law school, but there's no online law school and I cannot go to law. Unless somebody wants to sponsor me for two years to allow me to go to law school, I would happily accept that scholarship. So you think the, you think the brain is still... Ah, the brain is still sharp as ever. All right. Um, because the brain... We don't use our brain as much as the capacity of mm -hmm. our brain. Mm -hmm. You know, I always remember, I remember Mr. Pemberton Patrick, when I was um, Pemberton, Mr. P. Um, we, we sat on the NBD board together, he was the chair, and I was leaving on Christmas to go and do this um, global professional HR exam. He's like, Doc, what other exam? Be but for me, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know, yes. the more there are things to know. Wow. I love learning. So I'm always signing up for a course. I've signed up for several courses. I've done a lot of little certifications mm -hmm. along the way that I don't add to my CV. Because mm -hmm. it's really not for my CV, mm -hmm. I do it because I, I need to keep abreast of what's happening in the world and in my field. Mm -hmm. You know, you can run this country. Yeah, people say that. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. I think I've done a great job too. But, uh, but not, not so No, not, not now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if ever. But you don't know if ever, but certainly not now. I'm being told that you read a lot. Yes, I'm a reader. You're a reader. I mean, I don't get a chance to read. That explains you to I some extent. I don't get a chance to read as much as I did, but I tell you I was a voracious reader. I could just stay and read because out of a home, and I guess that's where it thing. If you were reading, you could not be disturbed. So my father had this rule that if you were reading, you couldn't be asked to go and wash the dishes, you couldn't go and ask to go and do chores. 
because my father had a school no one should be disturbed from reading so what did we do most of us read so because when they call and say father i'm reading <laughs> i'm reading you know my sister called was also a huge reader she was a librarian actually at one point the chief librarian um so yes i love reading i love reading i'm just gonna say a big hello to my friend ronald massacre that was the six of us ronald how did i forget you in that first role called lena gasso uh, you mean you want to recognize him? didn't call him. No, he didn't recognize, but he said me, he said me, why pass him? But Ronald, Good Ronald, evening, Ronald. Ronald, Ronald like, you yes, are. when I was in sixth form, <laughs> Ronald, should I give them that story? Give us the story, though. <laughs> we love the stories. Well, the sixth formers killed Ronald and see Ronald liked me. Uh -huh. And then there was a fellow, Ian Oliver, who was in grammar school. That's a bit who liked me. Mm -hmm. And at the time the Falkland War was going on with Argentina and England. So listen, they used that war to it was just it was just something else. So Falkland had a, a, a advance and then um the UK took over, blah blah blah. So they it's like Robin Ready Red, you're making Falkland win your oh it's just crazy. So you had two guys. Um uh, the guy okay. but Ronald and I uh no we never had any such um okay. intimate relationship but we will Good buddies, Ronald's we are good buddies. I know Ronald whole family because of Ronald. We are like tight. Okay. Yeah. As we're on a light really? as we're on a light moment before we continue talking about um uh, uh, how you went on after um all of this. One of the a couple of them want to know why is your head bald? Oh and I why do see. most and, and this is just a light moment. No, well when I was thirteen I cut my hair. I went to get bread in the village. And I said, ah, I just feel like cutting my hair. Because my sister called me one afro for many, many years. Yes, they're saying that some of your sisters also yes, have the same. And I said, no, let me go and just cut my hair. I don't know why. So we just, yeah, I was 13 years old. 13 years old. Did you have the authority to do that? No, I didn't ask anybody. I went to get bread and then I just was coming back. And I went and it was Darius Hogan's. The Hogan's were like the barbers. So when I got the Elrich was the one called the Elrich the I'm not cutting it. I said, Elrich, I'm not asking you for favor. You know, I have my money to pay for my haircut. And I I am sitting on this chair and I want a haircut. And he's there going back and forth with me, Elrich, but he's not cutting my hair. And we mentioned cut the hair. Blah, blah, blah. I said, Elrich, it's not a favor. I have my money. I think it was five dollars. And Elrich finally cut my hair. But my dear, Elrich butchered my hair. I already don't have hair lying already. All I have is a big forehead. Do you think he did it intentionally? Deliberately. <laughs> and which cut all into my hair. Like I looked really horrible. And so when I'm going up now, going back home and I reach, and then my brother Edgar is the first to see me. He's like, brother, what have you done? Well, I'm not going to talk to you until that hair cuts um grows back. I said, okay, fine. And then I reach home, he's like, and he's like what, what happened? I was like, oh, I don't know. I just feel like cutting hair. And I didn't cut it. And how's that? Then the same second, and he said they're coming to me to go and do something. I said, remember, you're not talking to me until my age grows What back. did your parents and say? By then, I was with Colin Inlewood. Okay. And, you know, and then, and we were all there. Yes, that was after hurricane. Crazy. That was after hurricane. And we lived in Belfast, and all of us was there, including that girl lived with Colin and them. And, uh, no, I don't think Edgar was the one who kind of objected the most. I don't think Colin and they just kind of took it in stride. And said, no, you should have asked. No, I can't. I should have. But I just, it was just a score of the moment decision. Which I suspect you do a lot of. And I have had my hair shot basically from 13 to now. Okay. When we were, we left high school for graduation, everybody said we should film and we should film and we should film. And we went to film. But my hair is strange. So when I film, if I put a perm in my hair, the middle of my hair just disappears. So I have a big ball patch in the middle. And then my hair have some red roots, so when you put this thing, all you see is red. So we have gone, Eleanor had taken me, Eleanor Philip, to her hairdresser somewhere in Baptist State. And this girl had put her little arm thing, and then when she took it out, the first dose, she saw this red patch and she saw this ball and she was like <laughs> scared. Not knowing that I have like a red roots, you know. And she put this black dye in my hair, unbeknownst to me. And when she was finishing her story, thinking she corrected, <laughs> This red thing that she thinks she maybe has spoiled. I looked in the mirror and I saw Golly Walk, I'm not lying. I was like, what is this black thing on my head? And I need this out, out, out. 
And so, I took it out. When I was at Kville, braids had come in and I wanted to do the braids and I went back and forth. And I did braids and they put it so long as I know that's too artificial. And then they cut it here. Ah, I maybe did that for about a week and I said, no, I can't delete that. Mm -hmm. And I just took it out. Now working for And then somewhere along the way, they wanted, when I was in the establishment, these girls went and they bought a texturizer. The next morning I got up, I called um, Eustace. I said, Eustace, what time are you coming in? I'm coming early. Please cut off this thing. And I went to Eustace and Eustace cut it off. And back to the mold. And then another time I tried some other something that didn't last because I couldn't comb it. I had to get somebody to comb it and that just made no sense. So voila. I feel like that natural hair thing that I'm doing right now, that's just not yeah, working voila. out for me. And my you. hair doesn't grow to a certain point, it then grows and then by the end of the day it's looking like really nappy hair, you know, all of this thing. So short just makes sense for me. Okay. And and, uh, and I cut it short like that so that I don't have because I don't have time to go back every week mm -hmm. every two weeks. Mm -hmm. So that will take me to another month. Okay. And then I can go. Okay. You know, by Joe one. Okay. I Joe one I have to give a big plug okay. because Joe when I go there, it used to be Kimani has been trying to steal me from Kimani. And then one time when Kimani, you know, had some issues and he wasn't working because I think of his son. So I started going to Joe one. But I don't like about Joe one. I go and he knows I have somewhere to run like tonight and half night and I said, boy Joe, how many people before me? It's like I can ask the sellers and then there you ask. I was in and I was out in less than half an hour. Did you ever have the um situations where you were made fun of because of your bald head that you look like a boy? Oh, people made fun of me for many things, but strange I never took it on. When I was in Mao mm -hmm. in primary school, Ali Hill, one day we played wrong words. And Ali Hill says he is the team, you know, it after the teams, the captain of the team, the head of that he picks back a neck. So everybody's like, back and like, who's that? He's all valid. <laughs> we were in standard two. Um, grade two. So I was start to laugh and I just moved along. I never made a fuss. I didn't quarrel. I didn't make a fuss. Back and like disappeared by the next day because I didn't make a fuss. You didn't react. Back and and didn't. I reacted over back and like, maybe up to this day they'll be calling me back and like, even when I don't look like a back and like. Is it you already sleep? I was very small. I was mm -hmm. very small. I think maybe about 40 actually. Okay. Um, yeah. And then this wits start coming and then God knows uh, up and down, up and down. But you don't you don't get bothered about the hair anymore. You just I've never bothered about my hair, you know. And people I, I don't know if anybody ever troubled me about my hair per se. But I used to be very small, so people used to call me about Meg and Meg's over. I never took that on. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things is that I learned very early, if you don't take on these things, then these things have a they die a natural death. Mm -hmm. So truly, I can't say people bullied me because they maybe tried, mm -hmm. but I was bulletproof, mm -hmm. bulletproof mm -hmm. because bulletproof. I didn't take on. And, and I'll tell you why. Because at our home, when we were going out, we had to pass like an inspection, you know, especially my brother Edna, to shut down the aisle properly. So for me, once I got the clearance and you pass that inspection, then there was nothing you could say to me for Diana to tell me that to make me feel that I didn't look good because I know from the time I left home, I looked good because I passed the clearance. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing you could say to me. You can't say to me, oh, well, I don't like that dress. Oh, that dress is ugly. Too bad. I remember one time there's a little yellow dress. I love that little yellow small dress. Every Sunday I used to put that dress. Even when that dress got too small, I used to put a little short pants under that dress for the church. <laughs> and then one child, we had a little dispute, you know. And she says to me, look at you. One dress alone you have every Sunday is that yellow dress. I say, really? Ah. I say, I choose to put that yellow dress every Sunday. But you want to come to my home after we leave church? Let you see. For us to see who I'm dress is your eye. And I'm sure it will not be you that win in that contest. <laughs> and that was the end of that story. You know, so you just move along. A little of the, your favorite from Pat Aaron. Yes, One or two people wanted to hear it. Yes. So let's take some of it. We'll be talking to Doc some more. Keep it locked. So. What did I do?
is actually her favorite group, oh, yes. so of all, all time. My favorite, the words. The and, words. And, and Sai does that song so beautifully. So in the early years of Mass Camp, actually, that used to be like our opening number. Um, you know, Sai doing that, you know, like our anthem song. Like, mm -hmm. I just love that. Dr. Henry, you've, you've, you have a vast, you have, a, you have quite a lot of experience. You've done a lot of major consultancies. How did you get to, to doing that? And, and, and tell me the connection to VF Inc. Was it before? Did it come <coughs> after? Well, it, it is a, a, a lot of it came after, after VF Inc. But it is like a, how do you say, it's a, it's a combination of things or mm -hmm. combination of things. Okay, so when I told you when I came back from studying, I was, um, my first degree, I spent three years as the coordinator of administrative reform program. And there is where I think my opportunity to do organizational reviews, and I've, all, I've said it before, in fact, I actually did a whole tribute for Mr. Ozzy Sims, who was my boss. He was the chief establishment officer at the time. And when I returned, I was, what, 22, um, going on to be 23, maybe, or 22. And Mr. Sims, I always said, gave me wings to fly. And we had an officer, she's now deceased, um, who... I sometimes, oftentimes objected, and he used to say to her, you know, just leave the child alone, she's young, she's bright, just allow her. And so he gave me, I always said, my boundaries. But within the boundaries, I was free to innovate, free to think, free to do this. If I wanted to go outside the boundaries, I had to consult with him. But once it was within the boundaries, he said, I was free to do what I wanted. To be creative, yes. to bring in your critical thinking. Thinking and all of that. And, and, and I think that's where, you know, I always said he gave me wings to fly. So by the time I left there to go and do my master's, I, I came with a bulk of experience from introducing the performance appraisal system in, in, in Dominica, reviewing job evaluations, and it was done already. It was done by Clarice Joseph, who I understood has passed a few weeks ago. Um, but people were still challenging their results, um, preparing job descriptions. And I was responsible for these um, persons, you know, who were the job analysts at the time. You had Mrs. George, or the George, who went on to form the Nehemiah School, and Miss Yolanda Giro. And they're like, Miss Cass, Celia Carr, who is now the present um, ARP coordinator, mm -hmm. was my secretary. There's a story there too, but we won't go into that tonight. And so I, I had that, and then I went to do my master's and at Manchester Business School. And I always said to persons, I don't think I learned anything much new, but what I did learn was a depth 
of knowledge and to juggle many things and must produce quality. And Manchester Business School Masters, well, MBA was very practical. We had to bid for real projects and go on to work for companies and to perform. Like I, but that's what I got to in there. So a team, you perform yourself into team, my consulting team. The companies send the notices and you bid, you apply for it, you have interviews. And our team had won a project. In India? For India. For, um, it was a British company who wanted to see if there was a market for the air filters in India. And so we went out to India for a few weeks to do research and all that. I also got my internship with Royal Life Estates. Was, at the time, they were the big real estate company. I was based in Newbury. They provide me for a car and everything because I had to be going around the place. So, you know, and so when I came back, and I always said, let me backtrack a bit. When I left you, I will give credit. As I always said, everybody should do their first degree at UWE. When I left UWE, and I know the modality has changed a bit. It's tough. <laughs> I see here then. No. When I left UWE, I said to persons, UWE equipped me for confidence. That there was no task I could not do. I may not have done it before. I may not, have, I may not know how to do it. But I will get to know how to do it and I'll do it well. That was what you will, I left you with. There was no challenge that you could throw at me. So that when I came in at UWE, and instead of being an admin officer, I was put in the RP. An admin officer was put in the RP where others went to other ministries and they rotated. I rotated nowhere. I stayed there forever. For the three years I stayed there. And some people did approach me and say, boy, that is like political victimization. Because, you know, my father was on the opposite end, the federal party. And I said, I don't care. I didn't even buy that in. I just said, I'm here to do my work. And so if Michelle's put me there for me to fail, then she has something coming for her. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Life is interesting. Years later, I'm at ECCB. Hurricane Louis. And I'm on the team assessing the impact of the hurricane. We come to Dominica. One of the persons to be interviewed was Miss Charles. By then, she was no longer the Prime Minister. She was the agent for United Insurance, I believe it was. And so we have to interview all insurance companies and so forth. And the team sent me to do that interview. And when I entered her little office right there, I'll never forget, she says to me, Oh, Miss Henry Baba, you know, I just wanted to, I've never said it before, but to say I admired you. And I said, Me, you do so much for to me or as a service. Mm. She said, Yes. And she said, One of the things I admired about you was your gumption. She said that. Because there was a training I had to go to, and Misha said I couldn't go. But it was about job evaluation and job analysis. And I'm, so I said, How do I supervise people? And they don't teach that at UWE. And there's a training. Mm -hmm. It costs government of Dominica nothing mm -hmm. except a podium. I said, Well, I don't have to get the podium. I'll proceed on my own. And Mr. Sims sent me to her and I said, but Mr. Sims, that's unusual. And when I went, she didn't even look up. I said, not standing. And she said, no, the answer is no. Blah, 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 blah. So I said, okay. So I left Michelle's office. I went to Mrs. Sims. I said, let me tell you something. She is your boss, not mine. You are my boss. I'm telling you I'm going on that train when I have to take leave. So I left and I was off to St. Vincent on that train. You hear me? So bold. And so when I met Dr. Samuel in the airport on my way back, he said, Mother, what have you done? I said, me nothing. He said, Mother, big trouble. We're waiting. You know, it's what your trouble. He said, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I took my leave and I went because I needed that training. And I did need that training. So now, years later, Miss Shah says to me, she admired me for because that conversation. Can you imagine that? You see? That? And then we had a wonderful conversation. And then she actually kind of admitted she sent me to that ARP as a test. And she said, but you did not fail. I said, but failing was never an option. And I said that to people. It's not me. Failing was not an option. And because I always said to people, because I love to read. Because I had some little issues too. Because some of the people felt that I shouldn't be me. How could I become? I never worked in the civil service before. I was just a little teacher. How do I become the ARP um, coordinator? And that was because Miss White, Jennifer White, was going on to study. Mrs. Deja was in that position before. She went on to study. Miss White then went in. And Miss Deja didn't come back. Then Miss White went. And then I fitted in. And Miss White, before she left, because she was very busy in the last few days, didn't have much time to give her like a hand. But she gave me six fives. 
one to six. She told me, read them. If I have any questions, ask her. But let me tell you, I, I heard it has changed. And I, for years, I've taught it, that filing system in the civil service. I actually brought in Rosemary Eli to establish that system for me when I formed VFA. That system where it was docketed that Mr. Grosner from Barbados was the one who introduced that system in the government of Dominica. From that six files, I moved to about 70 files on my desk. Why? Because it referenced, it tells you where to go and get, so there's a letter there, it tells you where you can find a similar, more information, this, that, that I love to read. I just asked for it. So that by the end of the six months, though I was not part of the early reform, I knew exactly what had taken place. As if I was there. Mm -hmm. And until one of my officers had said she was going to kind of lead me astray, I said, Me? I like to read too much for anybody to lead me astray. Because I don't really depend on people. I just go and do what I have to do. I'm not afraid of hard work, never have been, and never will be. And so after I, I left that and I went to, as I was saying, I did my master's at Manchester and we did all of these projects. So again, when I came back, tired like a little old dog, but. I came back again, no, even more confident that I could take on the world. Mm -hmm. I came, I was sent to train. I spent two weeks in train under Irwin Lara. Two weeks. Two weeks. And then I'll tell you what happened. I had applied for a job at ECCB and I'd done an interview and everything, but it was taking so long. But then Yui called me to come to teach. Mm -hmm. And I went off to Yui. They gave me, they seconded me to Yui to teach. So I spent two weeks in train and then I was moved to Yui. And you were here, you know, and Barriers, Barriers. Okay, and then while in the January, February, I got a call from ECC, me telling me I got the job, and like they wanted me to start like, to, like tomorrow. And I said, That couldn't mm -hmm. be. I said, Because before we went on Easter Christmas break, I called and said to you all, Have you made a decision? Mm -hmm. Because if when the second term commence and um, starts, I am not it from you. Once I start teaching the second term, I'm going to complete yes. the school year. Yes, can I do that to and the students? I started second term, and one week after the second term starts, I get a phone call from ECCB to say that I was successful and I'm like to come like next week. I said, that's impossible. I said, I can't come before June mm -hmm. because I have to finish Did the school. Did they hold a job for you? Yeah. So they called me back and whatever, and I said, no, I can't. And then they got the governor to call me because I was not budging. And so HR was contacting me and then the department. And Governor Venner called me. That was my first time speaking to Governor Ben, and he says, oh, Henry, I heard you. I said, Governor, if I were in your place and someone would leave me in the lurch like that, I would not hide them. I said to him, I said, well, sir, and I said to him, you know, I have called you all and blah, 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 and I said, you know what, if you want the very best, you'll wait for me. it. But if you want second best, and I said sometimes second best is good enough, then you will give the second person the job and they can start in a week. Mm -hmm. But I assure you that if you want the very best, you'll wait. You'll wait. They waited. And they waited. But not knowing that there was a backstory. So I entered ECCB June 15, 1994, bright eyed, bushy tail, and ready to go. And I came with my big happy self, good morning, not knowing that people didn't really shout out good morning to each other, <laughs> but I brought good morning, and then one person didn't answer, and I stumbled, I said, did you not hear I said good morning? Your first but day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, my first day, so I've been here forever. And then ECCB at the time, I know they still do it, when you join ECCB on the first day, you go walking and you meet everybody, they introduce you to every single staff. Yes, came on And then the first last time. person you meet, the last two persons you meet are the deputy governor, and the governor. On the day I got in, the deputy governor was out. I met the governor. And I'll never forget, the governor said to me, I never, um, he said, because we went back and forth over salary, you know? And then he said, you know, that made me, I wanted, I felt like I did something more like a command more. <laughs> and he looked like, Father, this is more than a PS gets, and blah, 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 just accept the salary. And the, but the first thing the governor said to me was that anything you asked for, we will have paid. And I, was, I said, really? Mm -hmm. I said, how? Because you don't know me, I don't know you. And he said, Mr. Lazar, Mr. Ali Lazar, had given a reference for me. And so anything I asked for, they would have paid. Mm -hmm. And that's why he waited. Even if in the department they was fuming, but I found out they were mad. Yes. Who is this person? Who does she why think she, she so is? important to that? 
And I said, but I never really worked directly with Mr. Larson. So, and I say that to people, I use that often to tell them, you don't know who's watching. Correct. But as the ARP coordinator, I service a committee, the committee of PSEs, when they, there was an ARP committee, and I was the secretary. So I did all the minutes and, you know, organized myself. And they always laugh, Mr. Johnson, when I come for the first meeting, I put my little agenda and I put prayer, this, that, that, and Mr. Johnson says, prayer? I said, yes, we will start this meeting with a prayer. And it remained on the agenda for the three years I stayed there. And so Mr. Lazar again seen me work and how I managed the meeting. There was nothing too big or too small to do. And I, my minutes were on time, my minutes were accurate. I followed up effectively. I, you know, kind of just like good spirits. Mm -hmm. And he, I don't up to now, I've not seen that reference, but whatever reference Mr. Laza gave. Yes. You would have put him in the And I could have said too, but I didn't even use Mr. Laza as mm -hmm. a reference. He said, yeah, but I know Mr. Mr. Laza, being the financial secretary, was on the board of ECC, which I didn't know. I see. And so governor, especially when, as he said, this person is demanding that mm -hmm. she's the best, mm -hmm. saying she's the mm -hmm. best, you know, asserting. He then had to ask Laza, who is this girl? Who yeah. is she? You never know and who's then watching. You never know who's watching. And then years or later. Or listening. Listening. You know, and years earlier, um, Rudy Joseph, I think that's his name, once was an establishment, and he said to me, you know, somebody admired me, I was like, admired me, how? And he said, just the way I, you know, and how I had encouraged him to go and study. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, so I always say to people, that's why we have to put our best foot forward at all times, because we never know who's watching. Mm -hmm. We never know how we impact people. And we can impact people positively or negatively. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you should try to never make your impact be a negative one. Mm -hmm. As much as possible, try to be a positive impact for others. Dr. Henry, you've, you've, you've been around the world, yes. literally doing consultancies, yes. um, trainings, yes. and all of that. Your, the list is this long that we definitely cannot go yeah. through them um, tonight, but which are some of those that have stood out to you or that you were surprised that you were probably called on to do or um, those that really, you know, you looked at it and said, oh, I'm being asked to do that? I'll say to you, my first assignment in Texas Kickers. Mm -hmm. And how it came about. Mm -hmm. Six and Kickers National Insurance Board, like the Social Security. I got a call from the director then, that was Trevor Cook. Never heard the man name, never knew him. And he said, I got your name from a person I don't really even know. He was in transit in Miami, this man, and he and this man struck up a conversation. And in talking to this man, he was saying, you know, what he needs for his organization. And the man said to him, well, if you want that help, the only the person you should call is Father Henry based in Dominica. Mm -hmm. And the man happened to have my number. The man gave it to him and that's how he called. To this day, I don't know who it is except it's a Trinidadian. Because he couldn't remember the name of the person. It's a chance meeting. And I went on to the work for Turks and Kirkus NIB. For many years, different projects from strategic plan to job evaluations to HR audits to you know investment management training to review of their portfolio to um, helping to mentor and coach their HR department and things like that. Another project that was um, for me was one of my big projects and that came through Carica was the government of St. Kitts. I did the job evaluation for the government of St. Kitts. Wow. In mm -hmm. fact, I, I went on through Carica to do a pension review because the government at the time was thinking of how do they establish a pension plan for the non-established workers because established workers had that pension but the non-established. And so I went on that project through Carica because it was a Carica project. Carica recruited me to do that. The government wanted to do a job evaluation and they came to me. But I said, I came to you through Carica. So you'd have to go back to Caricad to offer them the project and if they wanted to use me. And Caricad, at the time headed by um, Mrs. Jennifer Astervans, said I could go ahead. They were not like interested, I could go ahead and negotiate 
with the government of St. Kitts. And I did that and won that project for more than two years. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, that project from that, the offshoot of that, was, would have led to my first million dollar project. Eh? That didn't happen. A lot of envy and jealousy stepped in. And I tell you, that didn't come through for a host of reasons, of which I will not go through. And that's one of the things that I've learned and I've encountered. Because I'm really an open, naive person that everyone in this world is not you. So you judge people based on who you are, but you also have to learn to be wise. Mm -hmm. And if you're not cynical, if you're not careful, you could become cynical. And when I saw how that end, there were two people, two key people instrumental in this project that coming from. Even when we had a, we had not just a sign on the thing, but there was a, a letter stating that I had this project and all of the thing and the terms. And I could have taken the government and sent kids to court. But I didn't. I would go on to have two other similar experiences with two other institutions. One where we actually had a signed contract. Where? Two. In one in Anguilla and one in Tix and Kicks. Oh boy. Regional projects. Yeah. But you know, something, what that taught me is that. You know, we say sometimes it's Dominican, but I think it's Caribbean people, and who knows, maybe by extension, black people. Mm -hmm. We are not always happy. We, there's a lot of envy. I don't think Dominican just, I think it's envy. So that we see it and we say that it's too much for her. But we have no difficulties signing three, four times that value of this project for a white person, mm -hmm. a person from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But if it's one of ours, we trample on you. It's too much. Yeah. And we try all in our power to prevent that person from succeeding. And, you know, and I've said that before, and I know I sound like a broken record, but I go back to Edith Bell of Allen who said, I haven't seen that book, but I take Mrs. Allen word for it because she was an honorable woman. That this travel writer who said that Dominicans do not aspire to be like the Joneses, their aim is to bring down the Joneses. Wow. And I think that can go not just for Dominicans. I think to some extent, it can go for Caribbean people. Mm -hmm. That instead of being happy for someone, we, why is she? Or why is she that getting that? Mm -hmm. Why? You know, something is always too good for somebody to have. Instead of being rejoicing, instead of celebrating the people, instead of saying, well, if she could do that, so too can I. Mm -hmm. And you know, so along my little 15, in fact, tomorrow for my voice, tomorrow we celebrate to go to 15 that. years. Yes. 15 years. Listen, there have been good years, bad years, and some downright horrible years. Yes. I tell you, if I wasn't who I was, I would have crumbled already. But tomorrow, for my voice newsletter, it was due on Thursday, but I delayed it and it will be published tomorrow. I didn't put it out on Thursday because I knew I was going to do this show. Right. And I didn't want to put anything in it that may impact what you ask. Okay. So I said I would publish it tomorrow, and it, talk, it really talks about the journey, or 15 year journey. It will highlight some of the great points, the good points, and what are some of the lessons learned um, along the way. And it's a nice little story. I, I quite enjoyed reading it. You know? So you'll be sending it via I WhatsApp? I normally put it on via my WhatsApp, I put it on Facebook, I put it on LinkedIn, um, Christiana puts it on Instagram, and I think Twitter. I think so, mm -hmm. Mr. Pistol. Yes. And then I sent it out to, we have a client list, our client list. Mm -hmm. to send it out. What has, um, how has the COVID-19 impact, how has it impacted your business, your VFA business? COVID-19, when it came, I will tell you for me, I take it more in a positive way. Mm -hmm. COVID-19, when it came, girl, last year, we were short, that was our year of rebound. Mm -hmm. Things were coming into place. We had just, you know, our whole new relationship and with MSF, we've done some work and we were going places. MSF is more Nell Square's Francis um, in Grenada. You know, my little friend, my strategic partner, and we had, we were going to do some great work. We even had, we even got portfolios. Um, I have the FM portfolios, but we, I don't think they can see it. But we even got portfolios, but I didn't watch, she doesn't, she didn't know I did it. Just I move it a little more like that. This way? That this way. This way. Yes. She there didn't even know I was going <laughs> to do that, but because we had so much things planned in the, in the thing, I ordered these portfolios 
and my VFB and NSF associates and other things, you know, projects were coming. And I was like, yes, start. a lot of them were supposed to be starting in April and a few in May. And then COVID came. And with all of this lockdown, people have to do remote work. And so now we closed a bit earlier than the government. Uh, and people just, everything went on board. There was just one little income stream we had, and because we had already done the work, and but we had a payment, you know, for it. But I did not, and at the same time, um, our building on 78th Independence Street, I was rented. The tenant, they moved out, even without giving notice, without even informing me, but I found out before they moved. But I said nothing to them. I pretended I knew not that they were moving, but I, I knew they were moving. Well, let them know that now. Yes, I knew they were moving. I said nothing. And everybody was saying, and I was like, no, this is the right time. This is just a perfect move. And I just used that time. I checked for the first two weeks, I slept and just mm -hmm. rested. And then after that, I got up and I started going to my garden because my garden was going to come. Then my brother got, uh, I started going to my garden, I started weeding, and before I used to go and harvest. Mm -hmm. But then I found myself going to plant, going to mm -hmm. weed, mm -hmm. and I just, and that was just so <sighs> windy. windy. Mm -hmm. for the soul and then I started planning I started dissecting my business like it was a client and looking reviewing what it is we've done well what it is we have we failed and where what it is we need to fix up and I and I prepared new policies for us new things you know and to get us going and then I said you know there's no work you're not doing any, you have time, some more time on your hands. So offer some clients to do their stuff for them for free. Um, because you know that there's some of them who need to put new policies in place for remote work because they didn't plan. And some of the value not easy, I said no, because zero from zero leaves zero. Mm -hmm. So if I don't do it, I get You're no smart. income. If I do it, I get no income. But hopefully, if at the end of it, there is something that we're still doing that's not complete, they may give it to me. Or if they have something else, they may think that, hello, she did that for us for free, so voila. And so I did it, and some clients accepted the offer, and some didn't. And then one of our clients who accepted the offer, and for whom afterwards gave us our first project post COVID was Jasta Funds and Company Limited. And you know, and Jasta Funds and that's just now, that company has always stood by me. I tell people I can count on one hand my clients in Dominica. Tiesta Funds for us as one of the clients. Fortune Hotel Secret Bay, Fu and Gregor, Damasco, Social Security. You know, I can call them in terms of people who have given us work mm -hmm. over time, over the years. We've done some work for Springfield Trading too. You know? And, because I say if it's Dominicans have to depend on it's grass and eat. Because mm -hmm. they always say well, they're expensive and do this and do that. But I tell people, listen, there are different modes of transportation. I can have a, a bicycle. I cannot expect to pay for Alexa the same price I pay for a bicycle. Mm -hmm. And that's what oftentimes Dominican folks want to do. Pay you nothing for quality work and it just doesn't work, you know. And so, um, yeah, we did that. And then I just started doing different things. And I started, I always wanted to do that newsletter, but I just couldn't get time. I started that. I started, I them. I started my daily reflections. And you know, I just, I said to Pearson's and why, yes, there was nothing. I just had this positive energy. And even now, I still have that positive. I couldn't wait for 2021. Not because I could see what was ahead, but I think the promises that 2020 revealed will manifest themselves in 2021. Mm -hmm. And we were not going to do the phenomenal carbon women's symposium. And one day, I was just like reflecting and I said, like, no, you have to do it. Because for not doing it, you are, you are actually played into a, a, a mindset mm -hmm. of failure. Mm -hmm. And you do it. And you see what becomes. And that, notwithstanding all the COVID restrictions, was one of our most successful um, phenomenal Caribbean women's symposiums. And you know, we got a different clientele, we got a more social media savvy person. Mm -hmm. So the next day, we had all this nice stuff on social media, and I was really pleased and so forth. And I'm just here in 2021, just anticipating great things. Um, 
We have a few proposals out that we're expecting positive answers from. And you'll get them. And um, I'm just there, yeah, hopeful. And I mean, a few things happened to me on my personal front. Um, that somebody did me a really pity test. We call that pity test. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Truly pity test. And um, I remember talking to Father Peter here because that same day that PT test was done to me. Or oh, I found out about that PT test. It was done before, but I found out afterwards. And he was there to know what is there. And I said, Well, let us trade days. Mm -hmm. You know, you my have friend. my bad day. And I'm a good friend. And then I said to him, You know, Father Peter, I think what God is saying to me, Boy, Father Henry, you are to rely on me for all things. And one of the things, one of the Psalms that I, I, I really um, hold on to, Psalm 25. In the sense that it says, God shall never give my enemies victory over me. And that is what I think keeps me. Mm -hmm. That no matter how difficult the road, no matter how many obstacles that people try to throw in my path, or even evil designs, it won't succeed. Because God will not give them the truth. He will not do that. Doc, we're getting to the point where we have gone over our time. Yes, are we supposed to end at 10 o'clock? Yes, don't remind, don't remind them, Doc, don't remind them. Um, but what else do you enjoy doing as we, we get ready to wind? Oh, wind I enjoy my calypso. I, I tell people that's my main entertainment. Mm -hmm. Because you, I'm sure, you don't see me. I don't go running all over the place. Mm -hmm. I go from home to work to church. Mm -hmm. And calypso season... My little mask I'm tend. That brings me great joy. And even when I say, okay, I'm giving up, I'm giving up. You know, when you see the passion of the swellers, you know, you just have to step in to do the best you can. Mm -hmm. I love my gardening, as I just mm -hmm. said. I love spending time with my, my little Nathan and my nephews and my nieces. I love being in family and my friends. I hiking. Used, I used to love hiking. I still do. I used to be in this hiking club and I don't know how they took me out of their, their, their list a good while now and so when I just came back I used to go hiking like every Saturday and then somehow I don't know how I got off that list and I maybe they need to put me back on so I could do some work again. <laughs> I love the theater. I'll hook you up. I love the theater and that's what I enjoy about being in the metropolitan countries. So every time I go to the States or the UK, I we or this US. I will always make it a point of duty to go and see at least a play, a musical, or something before. Mm -hmm. Because, and when they have plays here, I will go. Um, traveling. I love traveling. I love cooking. I'm a homebody, really. I'm, I, I love cooking. I think cooking. I love cleaning, but right now I don't have time to clean. And mm -hmm. folks, I really need a cleaner. If you know, I need a help. <laughs> Let me just use that. I need a help desperately because my helper left. And listen, that is just too much. I cannot do it all. So I need a helper. I need a good helper, someone who's good with children. I do all my cooking, so they don't really have to cook. If they can cook this nice, maybe one day they'll cook, but I do all my cooking. But I need somebody to clean and to iron and to wash. I used to love cleaning. I love, because cleaning relaxes me straight. If I'm very tired, cleaning relaxes me. Because as I'm cleaning, I guess I'm cleaning up my mind. I don't know. Cleaning, but right now I just don't have time to devote to cleaning. I have so many other things doing. But cleaning, when I, especially when I was studying with my, my PhD, when I got to a roadblock, I just shot the window and I was upside down. By the time I was finishing that cleaning, I was back on track again. Okay, well, we hope you that know? we can get, we can get um, somebody to assist you with a good yes, person please, who please, can, please, please, good helper, somebody who can help, help you. Um, and people, Dr. Henry, you love people. I love people. I have a passion for children. I, I, I don't know, I just, I love people. I love people. I love for me, and I've always, I used to say, once, you know, at ECCB, uh, Val Mario was doing a training for the department, and he asked us to choose a symbol. And I chose the rainbow. And I chose the rainbow just because, yes, it's beautiful and all of that. But I say the rainbow is a symbol of hope. Mm -hmm. The rainbow is a symbol of faith because no matter what's happening and the rainbow says, we just must be a positive influence in the lives of others. And that's what I try to do. I don't always succeed because who's perfect? Some people may say, 
And I don't think I'm ever intentionally very mean to people. Um, but, you know, some people, our spirits don't collide, and I guess that's, that's okay. okay. That's all right. As my father used to say to us, if everybody like you, you have a problem. Exactly. You know, so some people, their spirits, but even if my spirits don't like you, I will not, I don't go out of my way to do harm to people. Mm -hmm. I try my best to always to assist along my journey. I love children. I want, especially young people. I, that's why I'm not, I'm not judgmental of young people. I always try to understand them because I tell you from my youth series, you recognize that a lot of the children acting up, when you get down to the story, there is a reason. And if you address that reason, then it owns itself. Mm -hmm. And then I love my, my little doggies. I love dogs. You love dogs. I love my dogs. Brenda Arlene writes, have to say, Valda, you're more than a phenomenal woman. You are truly a phenomenal person. Keep reaching for the stars and inspiring others to follow. Interestingly, just this week, her daughter asked me to add her to my WhatsApp group yes. so she wouldn't have to forward to her. So I didn't know she was a listener of the program, and I suspect I do not know many persons, maybe you don't know many persons, persons who listen to the yes. program, but I'm so grateful and happy. Yeah. For everyone who does and supports in whatever way that they do. We have to wrap up, Dr. Yes, Henry. Me. Give us your final comment. What it is that you would like to leave us with here tonight. What would I like to leave with you tonight? I don't even know. But what I like to say to people is that find out if you don't know it, the key thing you need to do is find out what is your purpose on this earth. I think we all have a God given purpose. And once you find what that purpose is, work towards that purpose. Don't get distracted along the way. Focus on fulfilling that God-given purpose. And if that's what you do, you'll find peace of mind, you'll find contentment, you'll find faith. And it is that purpose that keeps you holding on even when life challenges come at you. Because trust me, Life challenges come in places you don't expect, in, at times you don't expect. Because even if me, sometimes you are nicely sailing and you say, yes, I'm on a good path. And then, bow, you get thrown back like a hundred steps behind. And you say, God, and what holds you is that faith. Faith in God. Faith in you. Faith in that purpose. And if you do that and to have a thankful spirit, I always say if you're thankful, you can't get depressed. If you're giving thanks, no matter how things are, and that doesn't mean you don't have a little down day or down moment, mm -hmm. but you look beyond that and you say, okay, I need a new car. Like right now, I do need a new car. I cannot afford a new car, but I need a new car. But I'm thankful at least I have a car that can take me somewhere. Correct. So when I need a new car, I would love a new car. I'm not going to cry about, oh, I don't have a video. No, I don't have one. So find things, because every day if we look, there's so many things. Once a friend of mine had said to me, boy, I think God loves you more than others. And I was like, you're taken aback by that comment. And I said, no, God doesn't love me more than anybody. I think I may just be a little bit more thankful than most. Because I come to town and I get a packing, I say, thank you, God. Mm -hmm. The small thing. Somebody gives me a mango, because I love mangoes. I say, thank you, God. So... I say thanks for everything. I get up in the morning. I can have a pain somewhere, but I say thank you, God, I'm alive. I go home. I say thank you, God, you made me go through the day. I got home safely, and I can go to bed. I have a place to sleep. Send his little helpers along his journey, his little angels. And he just say thank you. And like that. And with that, I say thank you. <laughs> oh, for that, before what, you leave, I have a little oh. token for you. I oh, you okay. Leave. Oh my God, I'm always the one giving the tokens. I get a token tonight. <laughs> it's a whole bag. Yes. Oh, Dr. Henry, thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right, do we turn the camera around a bit? Can we do that? No, you can. Yes. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Thank yes. you so much from Dr. Henry. So oh, I want to show them what you got. Oh, let's see. Okay, let's see what we have. Let's see what we have in there. Oh, I know I don't allow you all to see me. Bookmarks. We have, what is in this box? Open, 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 open. Open the box, open the box. I am 
phenomenal. Oh, and yeah. this is so true. Thank yes. you, Dr. Yes. Henry, for that. Oh, Jesus, I'm going to start drinking my coffee. And I know there's a little from calendar from you. Yes. Me, Thank you so much, Dr. Henry. Okay, let's see if we can go back. Yes. All right. So that is a wrap, Dr. Henry, you were phenomenal as usual. Mm -hmm. And persons were saying words of wisdom for the last few, um, your, your, your closing remarks. And we really want to thank you for being here. My battery is, is actually dying on the phone. <laughs> I, doesn't want it to, I don't want it to die out on us. But, but an amazing program. Thank you again, Dr. Henry, for being here. I hope your business continues to flourish. I want it to much. flourish and that you um, you will bounce back from whatever it is oh, that you're bouncing back oh, from. Yes. And all will be well. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Folks, that's how we wrap it up on the In The Spotlight radio show for tonight. Join us next week, Monday. Carlton Lando, the pharmacist, will be our guest. The following week will be Ron Green. Looking forward to this one. And the following week will be Bernard Ito, the interim leader of the Dominica Freedom Party. Hope you join us for the remaining programs for the month of March. Good night, everyone. Until we meet again next so week. I am going to wave now. I could not move from the radio. <laughs>